TikTok, time to rock. Glad that uh, those of you who are watching were able to find me somehow. Uh, apparently some people, uh, a minority of people who are supposed to get notified actually get any sort of notifications. The vast majority of messages I'm getting say they are not getting notified. Um, and a lot of people who watch the live streams don't see it until <clears throat> until three or four o'clock the next day. And then they suddenly get notified and said I was looking for it and couldn't find it. What was what was going on? So I'm hoping that this is just some sort of technical glitch. YouTube is a huge platform. They do. I know they do lots of programming and so on. So hopefully this is just uh, some sort of temporary problem. Um, cause if not, it's, then it's sabotage, right? Then it's, uh, it's people actually making sure people don't get noti the notifications. We'll see. Well, if, if the problem keeps up, there are ways to get around that system. Namely that people can sign up for a, to get a text message. Um, that's not through YouTube so that whenever I post something, people can get a text message. Um, all right. Well, Hindu historian is ask, is asking, where's Muhammad Sharif? Uh, Muhammad Sharif didn't want to be on video. He only wanted to be on audio. So, uh, yes, Muhammad Sharif is here with us and he's going to be giving a presentation, uh, about Muhammad. And, uh, first we have, of course, Sam Shimon, Sam Shimon, say hi to everyone mm -hmm. in case it's a person's first time. Hey guys, hi, pray for us and <clears throat> trusting the Lord Jesus just to fill our lungs, our chest and throat with the breath of life and anoint us to speak truth for his glory in Jesus name. May you be blessed and challenged. Mm -hmm. Welcome. And uh, you all know me mm -hmm. now. Uh, mm -hmm. Muhammad, how are you? Are you here? Yeah. Uh, you, okay, thanks. Yeah, you'll need to you'll need to speak up so people can hear you. But why don't you go ahead and tell people a little bit about yourself before we get started? Okay, my name is Muhammad Sharif. I'm a British Muslim. And um, I don't, I'm not really like a scholar or anything, but I think I, I can try. You, and, and, and by the way, that's fine, ladies and gentlemen. So we pointed out that if uh, if Zakir Naik wants to wants to join us live, he can. If if Shabir Ali wants to join us live, he can. If uh, if Sheikh Yasser Qadi wants to join us live, he's welcome. Anand Rashid, Muhammad Hijab, Ali Dawa, any of the guys from Speaker's Corner, any Muslim around the world, uh, if you have an internet connection, um, that, that will, that will work for a live stream, then we are happy to have you. But also, um, you know, if, if an average Muslim wants to call and have a discussion, we can, we'll have no problem keeping it polite. Um, and, uh, our friend Muhammad here says that he'd like to give a 10 minute presentation, ladies and gentlemen, he says he has a, a 10 minute, uh, he'd like to give a pre he'd like to present for 10 minutes on um, on the question of whether Muhammad was violent and immoral. So we're just going to go ahead and start off by giving him uh, 10 minutes, and then we'll go ahead and have a discussion about his points. And um, someone's saying there's a little... Uh, let, let's just check the audio real quick. There's not a lot I can do from a call for a call from the UK, but uh, David <coughs> Sarmiento is saying there's a little feedback in the audio. Anyone else getting feedback? From from me? No. no, no, no. Yeah, I'm just I'm just checking. Uh, it takes about thirty seconds for people because we're about thirty seconds behind. But uh, everyone here, Matt George says clear. How's the audio, guys? Um. All right, I don't see anyone else saying they have uh, audio problems. So uh, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and continue and if we have any audio problems it, this it, it happens very frequently that you have audio problems during the live stream especially when you have people on from different parts of the world but uh we'll go ahead and start everyone's m most people are saying no and the, the sound is fine uh and they're saying feedback from the uk that guys that might just happen because you know we're we're we got a call from the from a different part of the world so um muhammad if you could just you know speak uh speak up and speak clearly and guys we'll do we'll do the best we can all right uh muhammad if you're ready you have about uh you have about 10 minutes muhammad peace be upon him he was um there was a jewish man and he wrote a book called the top 100 most influential people the third was Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Second was Isaac Newton. And the first was Muhammad, peace be upon him. And obviously it's not hard to get to the stage, but looking at the things that he has managed to do in his life, I think that he is 100% deserved it. Yeah.
Muhammad, he, he um, it was recorded that he never ever hit a woman, never beat a slave, and he actually, and he was the first anti-racist in history. Famously quoting that a white person has no superiority over a black person, and a black person has no superiority over a white person, and an Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab, and a non-Arab has no superiority over an Arab. So he's saying that no one is better than anyone else in terms of race. I want to mention four stories that really shows us who he was. Muhammad peace be him, he had a nephew and his name was Hussein. And Hussein, he had a stutter or a stammer. I don't know what you call it. This stutter and stammer, it was the worst of the worst. It was like, it took him maybe a few minutes to say a short sentence. And people used to always laugh at him. And it's not fair because he's only he was he was a young child, and he was, and he, he used to get laughed at just for having a stammer. And then also it says also we believe in Muslims that um, Moses peace be upon him he also had a stammer. So when people used to laugh at Hussein for his stammer, the prophet the prophet the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he used to always say, don't laugh at his stammer, for Moses had a stammer similar to that. And then ever since he said that, no one laughed at his stammer. And it's actually incredible. The next story I want to say is the story of one of the biggest enemies of Islam at the time of the Prophet. His name was um, Abu Jahl, which or um, in the Arabic language Abu Jahl, which means the father of ignorance. And his and he, and the father of ignorance, this person, like that's the nickname that the Muslims gave him. His his, his real name. But his name wasn't actual, actually um, the father of arrogant, uh, father of ignorance. But the Muslims just called him that because of who he was, and he's he was he had, he was at the top of multiple assass of multiple um, attempts of assassinations. And then his son came to accept Islam, and then the Prophet peace be upon him, he was aware that the son of this big um, tyrant was coming to accept Islam. So he said to the people in um, his, he said, he said to people in Medina, he said, don't laugh. So he said, sorry, he said, um, um, the, the son of um, Abu Lahab is, sorry, the son of Abu Jahl is coming over. And if he accepts Islam, then don't call him, don't call him, don't call him. Sorry, um, then do not call his dad, don't call his dad, don't call his dad Abu Jahl in his presence. So he's saying, don't call his dad the father of ignorance in his presence, because that might upset him. So you can see that the Prophet was very, he was very um, empathetic person, <clears throat> and um, he he also spoke against um, domestic violence, and his wife Aisha, peace be upon her, she once said that um, she she has never ever seen Muhammad hit a woman, a servant, or a, an animal. Except for the for the um, for the qurbani, which is like which is something it's like an animal that we kill to eat. It's like um, Christmas turkey, if you know what I mean. It's somewhat similar to that. Anyway, um, and then he also once um, somebody went up to the prophet. And he started to swear at him, really insult him. And usually, when people when people swear at you and start to insult you, you have you have uh, like you're tempted to insult them back, even though the prophet he stayed silent. And then his companion Abu Bakr even said he was he he was someone who loved the prophet more than he loved himself. And then he shouted back at the people. And because he shouted back at the people. Um, the the prophet he he left the gathering and then when and then when um Abu Bakr asked him why he said that when the people were insulting the prophet there was an angel in my presence who was insulting them but then when you started to insult them back that angel left and a devil took his place so you, so you can see he, he was careful not to offend anyone or do any or do any of those sorts and he also before he became prophet, men and women were not equal. People who people were actually ashamed to have women or daughters that they used to bury them alive. And then also there was a story of a per, of a person who had a daughter. He took his daughter to a wedding once, and then he buried his daughter alive on the way to the wedding. And then 
this story actually made the prophet peace with people and cry. Um, it says in the Quran, chapter 9, verse 71, women are individually responsible for their words and deeds and accountable to God, just like men. It says in chapter 3, verse 195, God recognizes and rewards the good works of every human being, male or female. Marriage, and it says in chapter 30, verse 21, Marriage is a partnership based on love and mercy. Perhaps this is why women approached the Prophet, peace be upon him, th that day, like the day was revealed, with over um, loads and loads of complaints of domestic violence. And then when the Prophet heard about this domestic violence, uh, I understand that the most common form of um, hating your wife was a slap. And then when the prophet, and then um, so he told his the the, the call to prayer, Bilal ibn Rabah. He told him to give the call to prayer, even though even though it wasn't the call to prayer. So when he said, so when he did the call to prayer, people looked, and then they came to the mosque to see what was going on. Like why did he do? Like why did he perform the call to prayer? Because if he was to perform the call to prayer, then the prophet wants us, sorry, like that, the prophet wants the people to go to the mosque because he has to tell he has to tell them something important. So when he so when he was there, so when the people w arrived at the mosque, masjid or the mosque, he said, um, the part of the prophet banned, did, um, slapping the wives or insulting the wives, and he said that if anyone hits his wife, then that wife has permission to um, to um, get an instant divorce, but they have to give their dowry back because in because in Islam, if you were to get married to someone, the man has to give the woman a dowry. And if they were to get divorced, then the woman has to give the dowry back to him. That could be just like a gold ring, or or in time of the Prophet, it was like a, commonly a garden or something like that. There was also prophets. The, the, the Prophet, the Prophet had a companion. His name was Julebib. He was the scholars described him as being hideous. He didn't look well, so no one wanted to look. No one wanted to look at him. No one wanted to talk to him just because of the way he looked. So then he so then once the prophet seen that Julie Bieber was upset, so he went to Julie Bieber and he asked him, "Why are you upset?" And then when Julie Bieb said, "Is the only wife I will get the wife in Jannah?" So then the prophet he he, he felt like and um, Jannah is just paradise. So the prophet felt upset by this, so he said no, and the prophet actually helped him find a wife. And then um, Julie Bieb, this person who was hideous, he actually died in battle. And then um, when the Prophet, and then like the, the moment the battle was over, the Muslims have won. And then he, straight away he was looking for Julebib. And then when he saw him dead on the floor, the Prophet actually cried on him. And then the Prophet said, he is like my, my brother. And then the Prophet also said in Sahih Muslim, the best among you is the one who treats his family the best. And I am the one who treats his family the best. And that's the end of my presentation, if you... All right, Sam. Sammy, there. Okay, now. Okay. You can good? you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? All right, yeah. All right, so um, I'll start off with, uh, with a couple of thoughts here. And then, um, <clears throat> Mohammed, uh, my first issue would be, um, so you mentioned a bunch of things you view as positive characteristics of Muhammad. I want to point out that, uh, well, we're going to have some disagreements on some of these things, but even if we granted everything that you said, when we're trying to assess whether someone is violent or immoral, we kind of have to look at everything, right? I mean, you know, there, in, here in the U.S., there was, a, there was a guy named John Wayne Gacy, and he would go to children's birthday parties dressed as a clown to keep them entertained. He uh, had a construction company and he focused on getting jobs for young people and helping people out. And he, he worked with youth organizations like the, the JCs and he was a pillar of his community. And you could point out, you could point out all kinds, if you made a list, you could point out all kinds of wonderful things about John Wayne Gacy. But if you wanted to really assess whether John Wayne Gacy was violent or immoral, you couldn't leave out the fact that he raped, killed, and buried 30, over 30 um, boys and young men in his basement. 
right? That, that, that would be relevant. That would be relevant. So anyway, my point here is we can look to anyone in the world, no matter how horrible, and we can point to all kinds of wonderful things that person did. For some reason, when we get to Muhammad, it's, look, he did this nice thing. Look, he said, don't make fun of this kid. Well, that, that may be, you know, whatever, uh, whatever issues we want to point out for Muhammad, we can't leave out some other very important things. And so, uh, but notice, I notice a kind of similar, a kind of similar issue that arises when Muslims are, are giving evidence. It's sort of focusing on, on only what's relevant and what can be helpful towards Islam and not focusing on the bigger picture. For instance, um, you cited at the beginning, and Zakir Naik does this, Ahmed Didat does this, but uh, it's very common for Muslim apologists to appeal to Michael Hart's book, The 100, a ranking of the most influential people in history. And uh, if you go to Didat, he'll, he'll, he'll actually, he would actually say that this is a ranking of the greatest people in history, not simply the most influential. The reason it's important to keep in mind that it's the most influential, Michael Hart is just focusing on the people who had the biggest impact on, on, on the world's population. And if you look at Michael Hart, um, I mean, Adolf Hitler's on his list. Joseph Stalin is on his list. Mao Zedong is on his list. These are people who slaughtered millions and millions of people in the 20th century. So he's not saying these people are good or great or moral, which is the topic we're focusing on now. Um, these are people who were incredibly violent. And so it wouldn't make sense to say these people were moral and peaceful because they're on Michael Hart's list. That would be very odd because the pe many of the people on his list killed millions of people. So that's one issue. The but the other issue I wanted to point out, just about you know start because you started out with this. Michael Hart is a is an interesting figure. He's he's not a historian. He's an astrophysicist. So he's an astrophysicist, not a historian. He wrote his book, The One Hundred. And Michael Hart is actually a a white nationalist and a white separatist, someone who believes that we need to split up the races, and that we need to cause racial division. And we need to split up the races and put different different groups in different places so that di so that the white race is not polluted by mixing with other people. Anyway, the only point I wanted to draw attention to here is when I hear Muslims like Zakir Naik and Ahmed Dida talk about Michael Hart's ranking, they put him forward as this world-renowned historian. He's not. It's not even his field. He's a he's a scientist. Um, they'll put him forward as this this mighty historian when he's actually a white nationalist, a white separatist who believes that Islam is a threat, but who has some strange criteria for determining who, which people influence the most people in the world, a list on which, again, you have people like Hitler and Mao Zedong. He puts Hitler, I mean, he puts Muhammad first on his list and suddenly in the hands of Muslims, this gets turned into even a world renowned Western historian acknowledges that Muhammad is the greatest man who ever lived. That's how it ends up in the hands of someone like Ahmed Didat. And so the only point in going on in, in, before, we, before we go on here is that there seems to be some very selective use of facts here. Right? When, when someone like Ahmed Didat points to Michael Hart and says that Muhammad is the greatest, uh, the greatest man who ever lived, according to Western scholars, and ignores the fact that the guy's not a historian, that almost everyone disagrees with him, that the guy's a white separatist, a white nationalist who views Islam as a threat, um, then it's it's just very strange to leave all of that out and to tell a vastly overwhelmingly muslim audience that western historians professional historians world renowned historians are acknowledging that muhammad is the greatest man who ever lived when that's not even that's not what what michael hart said he wasn't saying hitler was the was one of the 100 greatest men who've ever lived or anything like that so anyway the point is um there always seems to be this problem of uh selecting which details are included to make the best case for Muhammad while ignoring vastly more important details, such as this guy's not a historian at all, ignoring things like that when making the case. And so when it comes to someone like Muhammad, again, if we want to know whether he's violent, we'll have to look not at some particular thing. Uh, for, if we want to know whether he's immoral, we, we can't just look, hey, here's something he did that's moral. You could do that with Hitler. You could do that with Stalin. You could point to very nice, very moral things that they did. When you're assessing whether they're violent and immoral, 
You can't leave out the fact that they killed millions of people. You have to look into their reasons for doing those kinds of things. All right, so those are my initial thoughts before getting into any sort of specifics. Um, Sam, uh, yeah. what, what what are your what are your thoughts? And maybe maybe we'll go maybe we'll go yeah. one or two issues at a time, and we'll allow yeah. uh, Muhammad a chance to respond. And and here we you know he he's, he acknowledged that he's not uh, he's not a he's not a scholar, so we don't we don't want to uh, overwhelm him. But go ahead and give us some of your thoughts on on his presentation. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's <clears throat> everything he said here <clears throat> were based on, like you said, uh, selective citation of sources. Like he said that Aisha said <clears throat> that Muhammad never hit a woman or a slave. And so that's why I'm like somewhat baffled and I feel even uncomfortable for his sake, not mine, because I don't want him to think that we're now going to overwhelm him and we're trying to humiliate. That's not my intention, but he puts me in a situation where I have to correct this misinformation. I'm not saying it's deliberate on his part, but here, Sahih Muslim. <clears throat> Sahih Muslim number 2127. And I'm aware of what the Muslim polemicists from the UK say, and I'm going to address and refute their distortion of the Arabic term because I actually had to write on this because they were embarrassed by this hadith. Here's what Aisha said, because you refer to Aisha. This is Sahih Muslim number 2127. <clears throat> He struck me on the chest, which caused me pain. He struck me on the chest, which caused me pain. Now, it's a very lengthy hadith. We can go through it if you want, but I'm going to the relevant part, and I'll even give you the Arabic term and the Arabic lexicons, and it means to strike with the intent of causing pain and hurt, not simply a loving push, like some of your polemicists from UK suggest. He struck me on the chest, which caused me pain, and then said, did you think that Allah and his apostle would deal unjustly with you? Now, <clears throat> if you want, you need the lexical sources for me to show you that it's he struck her and he caused her pain. Here's another version done by Muslims. It's not by me. That was Sahih Muslim. Here is Sunan Nasai, volume 3, book 21, hadith 2039, done by Muslims, translated by Muslims. He said, so you were the black shape that I saw in front of me? He, and I said, yes. He struck me on the chest, which caused me pain, sahih. Now, I know that Muslims say, oh, that's a bad translation. doesn't mean that. Okay, let me just read some lexical sources, all right? <clears throat> Here it is. Let me give you the lexicon. This is Edward, Edward William Lane, Arabic English lexicon. The word lahit. He pushed, pushed away or repelled him or pushed him violently upon the chest or he pushed him, pushed him away, or repelled him on account of his baseness or despicableness, or he struck him in the breast or in the bases of the breast and in the bases of the shoulder blades. Another source. This is <clears throat> Francis Joseph Steingrass, Arabic English Dictionary. Lahed, lahed. Oppress, jade, beat, push. Now I can give you more. So it's not true. It's simply not true that Muhammad did not hit women. He hit Aisha, the very one you quoted as saying he didn't hit the wives or the slaves. Yes, he did, because you just testified that he hit me. Now, you also mentioned that if a woman is beaten, she can ask for a divorce and reserve her dowry. I really don't know what tradition you're reading or what Quran you're reading. The Quran hadith say a man has a right to beat his woman if he fears rebellion on her part, but I'll wait because I got massive amount of narrations to that effect. But I just want to take one at a time because then I would like to talk about blacks and how Muhammad was racist. Mm -hmm. But let's stay stay here. Yeah. What do you say about that hadith? Yeah, I, I just they, wanted to. I just wanted to add so, add something, and then um, uh, and we'll, we'll stay on this point, and then and then Muhammad can uh, give us his view. But uh, yeah, so you you have on this issue you have Muhammad mm -hmm. and even if we went with the original hadith that was cited, Muhammad never hit a woman, never hit a, never hit a wife. Even if we went with that and took that and, and ignored everything else that we find in the hadith, which contradict this, then we'd still be stuck with the Quran saying it's perfectly okay for men to beat their wives into submission. And this is a revelation. So I don't know why Muhammad would, con would consider it evidence that Muhammad is moral for not beating his wife when Allah in the Quran says it's okay to beat your wife, right? So if Allah says you can beat your wife as a means of disciplining her, then it's not a bad thing. Allah is saying you can do this thing, so it's not bad. So Muhammad beating his wife would not be a bad thing, and him not beating his wife and never hitting one of his wives would not be evidence that he's moral. It would be evidence that he's moral. If Muhammad never hit a woman, that would be an example of him 
being good in that sense from a Western perspective, but not for an Islamic perspective. So we can't ignore the fact that it, when we go to the Muslim sources, one, Allah, Surah 4, verse 34, says you can beat your wife into submission. Two, this situation arose, according to the historical uh, historical background, because a woman came to Muhammad, so. because a woman came to Muhammad and complained that uh, her husband, I mean, had hit her in the face, and then the ruling came down from Allah. It's perfectly acceptable for him to hit you in your face. We can't ignore the fact that uh, Muhammad's companions were beating their wives. That uh, that Muhammad's companions could beat their wives until their skin turned green, and that was all acceptable. So, if you are praising Muhammad as moral for not beating his wives, one. We disagree with that because we have other sources that contradict the source. And two, if it's immoral to beat your wife, then Allah promotes immorality and Muhammad's companions, even though they were the best generation of Muslims, according to Muhammad, were immoral for beating their wives. And so the question would be, can you be, can you be moral if you're promoting immorality? In other words, let's suppose Muhammad is moral because he refused to beat his wife and he was always super gentle with his, with his wives. Then... If he's going around simultaneously saying, hey, guys, it's OK to beat your wives into submission. Is it OK for him to promote immorality? Because you seem to view it as immoral. In other words, just to give a parallel here, um, Muhammad clearly during at least at, at one period in his career allowed his followers to hire prostitutes, pr temporary marriage, muta. Now, you could say, well, Muhammad, if someone said Muhammad never did muta, therefore he's moral well, then it would still be immoral for him to promote it in his community and to allow it in his community. And so those are kind of the issues that, that we would bring up on, on first glance. So go ahead and uh, what do you respond on this issue of uh, wife beating and so on? Well, um, I think personally, David, um, I want to ask you a question. Do you think that under any every single situation imaginable, you're not allowed to use some kind of force to wife? Every single situation every single situation are you asking me or david uh, david uh, if you're if you're asking me is there any situation where a man could could hit his wife of course like if my wife were out of her mind and she were killing my kids and she was about to stab my kids or something like that then yeah i believe you could get physical with your with your wife in in that situation exactly this verse tells you how to be your wife not to be your wife okay uh muhammad you, you ignored what we said you argued Remember, we're going by your arguments. So if you want to change your argument, then that means you just conceded that argument's weak. You said Muhammad <clears throat> never hit his wives. So if I show you Muhammad struck his child bride and caused her pain, that was your argument to show he's moral. That means now, according to your argument, he must be immoral because he did hit his wife and he hit her to the point she felt pain. So now you're changing the argument, which is fine. I don't mind because you said it's telling you that you can beat your wife, but doesn't mean you have to. But you forgot what David just said. And I have the Hadith. I can read them, but I'm trying to give you a chance to respond. Not only was this passage theoretical, he just told you it was supposedly revealed to justify a man actually beating his wife and leaving a green bruise in one occasion. And on another occasion, it says he slapped her in the face. And then the verse came down saying he's within in his right to do so. See, this is not, this is not a theoretical passage. It's a passage condoning actual violence against wives so let me ask the question again do you now take back the fact that your maha your prophet never hit any woman when i just quote you a sahih narration saying he did hit strike hard in the chest his child bride causing her pain so do you take that back in the dictionary the, w the word for hitting is darab, not lahad. No, not, darab. no not here not in this hadith it's not darab. it's lahad. i just said that i gave you the dictionary yeah i know but like uh, um, lahad means to push, not to hit. Dharab means to hit. The, the hadith used the word lahad, not dharab. Yeah, but that's the hadith where with Aisha it's lahad and it says it means to strike to cause pain. Do you want me to read the dictionary again? No, it's not like you, you, like you don't know what I mean. I'm saying in like in the dictionary, Arabic dictionary, it says the people that translated it translated the hadith wrong. The hadith was translated. It Muhammad, should, should you're, Muhammad I don't mean to cut you out. You didn't hear me. Let me try this again. Francis Joseph Steingas, Arabic English Dictionary. Lahad, oppress, jade, beat, push. Beat is one of the meanings. Okay, that's that's one dictionary. Here's the other dictionary. Edward William Lane, Arabic English Lexicon. 
one of the meanings, or he struck him in the breast or in the basis of the breast and the basis of the shoulder blade. So please, I gave you what the hadith say. And part of the meaning is to strike, to cause pain, violently, to beat. It is part of the meaning. And the hadith even says, Aisha said, when he struck me, he caused me pain. So you can't soften it. Even if you want to say it's push, it's a violent push that hurt her. So he did strike her. So do you want to take that argument back? Honestly, um, can you, like, I don't really get like, what you mean. So, like, um, just, just to get this straight, are you trying to say that, um, the, that the word lehead in this situation, in, in this situation means to push? And even if it was, even if, even if lehead was to mean push, it wasn't really a, a violent push. That's not what Aisha said. So, so if Aisha right. doesn't know what she's talking about, you know more because you were there. Here, let me read what she said. He struck me on the chest, which caused me pain. Sahih Muslim, 2127. So are you saying Aisha doesn't know what she's talking about? She's slandering Muhammad? Let me read it no, one more time. I'm he struck me. Let me go with your definition. He pushed me on the chest, which caused me pain. And why he did that? Because he was angry with her because she startled him. He got afraid because he saw a black shadow. So out of anger, he did this. So it says it caused me pain. So are you going to justify that? Le but 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 by by the by the way, Muhammad, uh, th this is actually to 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 help you here. I don't know why you would object to Muhammad doing that. If you wanted to say it was an an, an ang a push in anger, then that would actually be in line with your understanding of Surah four verse thirty four that it's not telling you to beat your wives in in all situations. It's telling you how to beat your wives. And so as in the situation that's necessary. Yeah. So if, so if, if she, I mean, the, the, the situation in Sahih Muslim 2127 is that Aisha snuck out of the house. It was following Muhammad around to spy on him. And then he had seen her, you know, he'd seen a shadow running around and so on. And then he catches her um, when he gets back to the house and he's, uh, he's upset with her because she was sneaking out, keeping an eye on him, which means she didn't trust him. And then the Hadith that, that, that we read says that he struck her in her chest, which caused her pain. And this is coming from Aisha herself. The Muslim response is, the Muslim response is, no, 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 it must mean, it must mean push or shove or something like that. Sam's point is that, okay, what, whatever the shove is, it's not a gentle tap. It says, she mm. says that it caused her pain. So it must have been some very forceful shove in order to call, cause her pain. But if you believe that Surah 4, verse 34, so this is my point actually actually defending you based on what you said. Not that I agree with you. I'm just saying in order to reconcile this with what you said earlier, you, if you believe that Surah 4, verse 34, allows you to discipline your wife in certain circumstances like this, you as a Muslim could say, but this is a situation where Aisha is trying to deceive Muhammad and she's not trusting him. And so this would be a situation where she could, where he could actually put his hands on her and whether it's a, it's him hitting, punching her or him shoving her, then, you know, he would be allowed to do that in order to discipline her because the only requirement in Surah 4 verse 34 is if you, you are somehow fearing rebellion from your wife. So Muhammad can be in that situation, fearing rebellion mm. from Aisha. Look, this girl's sneaking out of the house to spy on me. That's not a good wife. And so he could do it according to your reasoning now now sam let's go ahead and let him respond to to uh, yeah, yeah, to any of this. i want him here yeah please respond to that that he did strike her yeah like i like that's what i mean like what david just said that's basically like what i mean if you know okay so he was justified he could strike her then right in like because it, it's not like how could it is you have to look at the culture as well this is arabia mm -hmm. this is 632 ad Okay. Now, Muhammad, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Okay. There was a lot of cultural practices that Muhammad did away with. He did away with adoption. So why didn't he do away with this cultural practice? Why did he keep the one cultural practice that does damage to women, but the other practice, which is humane, adoption, he got rid of? So, uh, so why Sam, are you appealing to culture? Sam, I would actually use a, a more uh, a, another uh, example. Um, Muhammad, I, I mean the Muhammad we're, we're talking to, brought up the 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 idea of yep. uh, uh, female infanticide, that exactly. daughters could be killed because people didn't want them. That was a cultural practice. And so, 
Muhammad was clearly allowed. So in, in his case for why he believes that Muhammad was moral, um, our friend Muhammad here said that, well, Muhammad did away with a practice that was harmful to women. Women, you know, girls, little girls, baby girls were being thrown out in the desert to die. Muhammad did away with that practice. And so that's, that's, a, that's evidence of his morality. Well, if Muhammad could be, mor could be moral by overthrowing <clears throat> cultural practices that are harmful to women, he could have also done away with uh, beating, beating women into submission. So, yeah. And have him also, I want him to also adjust the adoption because that was a humane practice he did away with. So he did away with a humane one. So why is that? The killing young girls, we kudos, wonderful. That shouldn't be done. But then also he got rid of adoption, but he left the culture practice of beating wives that you fear rebellion. Why is that? How do you mean? I don't know how what do you that? mean. How do I mean? Okay. You heard what David said. You brought up the point. David's repeating your point. That one of the moral virtues of Muhammad, he condemned infanticide, the killing the bearing of infant girls. So that we say, praise God, what a great practice. We we respect that. Absolutely amazing. But Muhammad, you said that it was a cultural thing at that time. It was culture to beat a wife that was rebellious. So Muhammad is simply following the cultural norms, the practices of the culture. But wait, Muhammad did away with cultural practices he didn't like, like bearing girls and even adoption. He stopped adoption. Adoption was humane, which is a beautiful gift from God he did away with. So then why keep that cultural practice of beating your wife? Okay. Uh, um, I want to make two points here to reference what you just said. He he um, took away adoption, but like he, he put on fostering as well, because he, he didn't think that it was right to give another child his last name. You see what I mean? So that's why he said adoption is wrong, but fostering is right. Fostering is one of the things that make you a good Muslim. And secondly, um, what's like what's worse, pushing your wife um, in a way that, that that will hurt her, or killing a baby? Okay, well let me answer that. So he'll do away with adoption because you should name them after their parents. But then you have orphans whose parents have died, and orphans who don't know who their parents are, and then you have mothers who are barren who can't have children. The only way they can have a family is to adopt children, and only for these orphans to have a family is if someone adopts them. But thanks to your prophet, that will never be the case, and we know why he did that. You didn't give us the cultural context or the historical context. Muhammad did away with adoption. If you go to chapter 33 of the Quran, verses 4 and 5, and chapter 33, verse 40, and you read the tafsir, you read Ibn Kathir, of chapter 33, verses 4 and 5, in chapter 33, verse 40, it says that the practice of adoption was abolished because Muhammad was being embarrassed by people who accused him of taking his son's wife, Zainab bin Jash, because Zayd, and you know this, Zayd ibn Haritha had been adopted by Muhammad to be his son. And then people said, look at this man. He took Zayd ibn Muhammad, his wife, and then he abolished that practice because they were embarrassing him for taking his son's wife and his response was well hold on he's not my son in actuality so stop saying he's my son name after his father so no that wasn't a good reason to do away with adoption because it's very humane so but my point is if Muhammad could do away with these cultural practices why did he not do away with the cultural practice of beating his child bride because killing a baby is worse than, than pushing your wife in a way that will hurt her I agree what I agree with that yeah. Yeah, we, and I'm not saying that, but why not do away with that too? It's a lesser evil, but it's an evil nonetheless, because you keep talking about Muhammad pushing, even though he struck her, but you forgot what we said. In fact, to put it in perspective, let me read you a hadith, because it's not just Muhammad. That verse in the Quran is now something that gives all Muslims in all places at all times until the end the right to do that to their wives, and it's not simply a push or you hit them with with a miswak, a toothbrush. Because here, let me read to you, Sal Bukhari, Sal Bukhari, volume seven, number 715. Sal Bukhari, volume seven, number 715. Narrated Ikrama, <clears throat> Rifa divorced his wife, whereupon Abdurrahman bin Az Zubair al Qurayzi <clears throat> married her. Aisha said that the lady came wearing a green veil 
complaining to her of her husband and showed her a green spot on her skin caused by beating. Green spot. It was so hard that left a spot on her skin caused by beating. It was the habit of ladies to support each other. So when Allah's apostle came, Aisha said, you appeal to Aisha's testimony. Now I want you to hear Muhammad, Aisha's testimony carefully. Aisha said, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing woman. You said earlier that women were honored and given rights that was unheard of before Islam. Let me read Aisha again, Muhammad. This is Sayyid Bukhari, volume 7, number 715. Aisha, the one you appeal to. I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing woman. Look, her skin is greener than her clothes. Now I can read the rest of it where Muhammad didn't re rebuke the man. He got upset with the woman because she accused her husband of being impotent. And he told her, go back to your husband. So now here you have not just Muhammad who pushed Aisha. A man beat his wife so hard he left a green bruise. Aisha said, I haven't seen women suffer as much as believing women. That means unbelieving women had it better than Muslim women. And Muhammad doesn't rebuke the man, but he rebukes the wife. And why did he hit her? Because she accused him of being impotent and didn't want to have sex with him. So are you saying this is okay? No. It's not okay? That's not okay, no. But the, why, didn't you, why did your prophet say it's okay then? He didn't condemn the man. So what's the hadith called again? I want to say so. What was that? You say what's that? the hadith called? He's asking what the hadith is called. Oh, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Bukhari, volume 7, number 715. It's Bukhari. It's Sahih. It's Bukhari. It is Sahih Bukhari. Mm -hmm. Volume 7. Um, what's the rest? Volume 7, number what? Number 715 in the English. It's right there. I mean, you want me to send you the link? I can. I can uh, .com? Yeah. It's okay. I've got it. Okay, so you said it's not right. So you said Muhammad did something that's not right. So that means he's not a moral example. Uh, I just wanted, uh, uh, Muhammad, just in case you're using, there are basically two different numbering systems for Sahih al-Bukhari. There's the one that numbers them individually by volume, and then there's the one that n that numbers them all the way through. If if you have the, if you're looking up the volume that labels them all the way through, then this is uh, Sahih al-Bukhari number 5825, 5825. So I'm not sure which one, which edition you're looking at. Yeah, I'll go over. So the, can I just, can you just give me a second to read it? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, matter of fact, Sam, if you want to take a question or two, uh, because, yes. you know, you know uh, Muhammad acknowledged that he's not a scholar, so if he wants to look okay. through this, that, that's, that's fine. So, um, yeah. so guys, if, if you he want wants to, to go to another subject, that's up to him as well. I mean, because so well, he, far, he, no, he, he's yeah. saying he, he's saying he just wants to read through it real quick. So that's okay, fine. So if you want to take right. a uh, you want to take a uh, question from the chat here real quick while he reads through that. Um, yeah, do you see anything? I'm trying Let's to see. You. Guys, you got a question? You got a question you want us to answer during this pause, real quick? Yeah, there are holes in Bukhari. Someone said, "Well, hey, that's that's that's, that's true. The that's true. We we don't take any of these sources as infallible." The Muslims who are Sunni, though, right? So, all right, no, they're just waiting for him to respond to that. But yeah, folks, I mean, guys, just for those of you, recap if you mm -hmm. don't have a question. Just to recap the narrations. Say Muhammad struck Aisha in the chest and caused her pain, and a man beat his wife for accusing him of being impotent, didn't want to sleep with him. And Aisha said, Aisha said she hadn't seen any woman suffer as much as believing women. That means believing women, Muslim women, had it worse than unbelieving women. And Muhammad didn't condemn the man, but condemned the wife for falsely accusing the man. So according to the criterion that was given, the criterion that was given. That Muhammad is a moral example because he was exemplary towards his wives, didn't hit them, didn't hit slaves, and and a wife who gets hit has the right to divorce. That actually is not true according to the Muslim sources. So according to that very criterion, Muhammad fails that criterion. Therefore, he's not a moral example. That's the first point. So just to recap. and then Yeah, and uh, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, this is actually a very important hadith. Uh, whenever someone is saying that Muhammad gave women unparalleled rights or Muhammad was a great example, keep in mind, this is this is not coming from some random person in some random source. This is from Sahih al-Bukhari, and it's coming from a it's coming from Aisha, who is the mother of the faithful. And she says, in the presence of Muhammad himself, so Aisha, who had seen Islam implemented perfectly under her husband's leadership says 
about this woman whose skin was green because her husband beat her until her skin turned green. She says, look, her skin is greener than her clothes. Her skin is greener than her clothes. Aisha said, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. So think about what Aisha is saying there. Right? Aisha is saying, look, we have pagan women. We have Jewish women. And the women who suffer most, the women who have it worst, the women who are most frequently abused and beaten until their skin turns green by their husbands, are all Muslim women. Why? Well, they had a divine, they had divine justification for beating their wives into submission, right? So Aisha is saying, look, Muhammad, whatever your revelations are doing, they're causing tremendous problems for women. And it says, Aisha, it even says that the women, it was the habit of the women to stand up for each other. They're sticking up for each other, trying to get some sort of justice because their husbands are beating them until their skin turns green. And, and, Aisha is saying, look, 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 at, look at what Islam is doing to us. And somehow, somehow we get to 14 centuries later. And one of the reasons we know that Islam is wonderful is because of the amazing impact it has on women. What's, what's, what shouldn't be surprising is you can look at statistics even today when these global organizations like the World Economic Forum and, and organizations like that do studies of the gender gap between men and women, namely the difference in rights and privileges and how they're treated under the law and what age they get married at and what opportunities are available to them. When they compare the status of men and women in society, you'll always find that 11 out of the 12 or 18 out of the 20 worst places in the world to be a woman are Muslim majority countries. And you look and you look and you say, wow, it was this way from the very beginning, from the very origins of Islam. And so uh, Muslims, I would say, if this is where you're, if you're building your case upon women's rights, you need to throw out a lot of your history because your history tells a, a very different story. Uh, all right, Muhammad. Um, yeah, um, can I just like, like um, absolutely, allow to use? Absolutely, go ahead. So it says, Raif had divorced his wife, whereupon Abdul Rahman ibn, uh, uh, ibn Zubair al Qurazi married her. Aisha said that the lady came wearing a green veil and complained to Aisha of her husband and showed her a green spot of her skin caused by beating. It was the habit of ladies to support each other. So when Allah's apostle came, Aisha said, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believer woman look, as a believing woman look. Yes, that's what we just read. Yeah, no, no, no. Like, let me finish off. Look, his skin is greener than her clothes. When Abdul Rahman heard that his wife had gone to the Prophet, he came with two sons from another wife. She said, by Allah, I have done no wrong to him, for he is important and is as useless to me as this, holding and showing the fringe of her garment. Abdul Rahman said, by Allah, O Allah's apostle, she has told a lie. I am very strong and can satisfy her, but she is disobedient and wants to go back to Raifa. Allah's Apostle Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to her, if that, if that is your intention, then you know that it is unlawful for you to remarry Raifa. Unless Abdul Rahman has had, had, in the past tense, had sexual intercourse with you. And the Prophet says, saw so two boys with Abdul Rahman and asked him, are these your twins? Allah Abdul Rahman said, yes. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you claim what you claim, that he is impotent, but by Allah, these boys re resemble him as a crow resembles a crow. Yes. Okay. So as so as you can see, there was um with the woman that was hurt and the woman's wife, you can see that um they had like the, they had a bit of an argument because she, she said one story, and then the, and then the husband said no that didn't happen, this something else happened, mm. and then the husband said that he wanted to use her for sex, and then the prophet sallallahu said. But if that if your intention is to use her for sex, then that's haram. That's forbidden. You can't do that. Um, hey, Muhammad, what yeah, does that, that got to do with uh, the man beating her and like leaving a green spot on her? What does that got to do with that point? What does that have to do with that point? That's a good question. That's the fact that um, he didn't say that it's okay. It's perfectly justified. To no, hit it. Muhammad. No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't try to and assume that because he didn't. He didn't say hit her, that somehow that means Muhammad is absolved because why did Muhammad rebuke him too? He could have said, look, your wife is wrong for accusing you, but you should not have hit her 
and left a green mark because according to my sunnah, you have to tap her with a miswak lightly. How come you didn't correct him? Why did he just jump on her? He could have rebuked him and her, but instead he rebuked her and said nothing to him. And that's just one hadith. Another hadith, a man slaps his wife and Muhammad didn't say anything because Allah told him no, he's right to slap his wife in the face. Can I give a term? Come back to the hadith that we're talking about. Yes. There was, there was an issue bigger than slapping you, than them, than the green spots. And that was the fact that, that the husband was using the wife for sex. And then that's when no, Muhammad said no, him. No, that, that's, uh, let, let me, let, let's go through this. And if this is the first time you, you've read it, this, this, actually, this actually takes a couple of readings to, uh, to really get your mind around. So let me see. I will actually try to pull it up on the screen here so everyone can see it. And let's see. All right, I've got it up on the screen. I don't know if you can. I don't know if you can see. Uh, if you can uh, see what we're reading here. Uh, but no. Well, you, you just read it, so I know you have it. But this is for everyone else. Um, so uh, let's just go through this a, a little bit here. So basically, they, so everyone can see it right now. The background of this of this story. So you have Rifa, a guy named Rifa. He divorces his wife, and his wife marries another man. She marries Abdur Rahman. Right, so she marries another. So this is not about Abdul Rahman using his wife for sex. According to her, he was impotent; he couldn't have sex. That was her accusation against him. So this is not about um, about him using her for sex. She's saying she he that he's impotent and can't do anything. So Rifa divorces his wife, and Abdul Rahman marries her. Then this man Abdul Rahman started beating her, and he beat her until her skin turned green. So uh, Aisha finds out that uh, this woman had been beaten until her skin turns green. She comes to Muhammad, said, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. Look, her skin is greener than her clothes. So she's looking to Muhammad for justice, right? Then we read, when Abdur Rahman, so her current husband, not her previous, not her, not her divorced husband, her current husband, Abdur Rahman, heard that his wife had gone to the Prophet. He came with his two sons. Those two sons are very relevant. Those are two sons from a different wife, not from his current wife. From I mean, well, could could be uh, another wife that he has currently, but uh, uh, sons from a different wife. She said, "By Allah, I have done no wrong to him." So she's saying he beat me without a cause. She said, "I have done no wrong to him, but he is impotent." and is as useless to me as this, holding and showing the fringe of her garment. So she takes the fringe of her garment, shakes it, and says, he's as useless to me as this. In other words, she's saying okay. that this is basically this is basically like his penis. What, one second, I just want to, not, this is not for you. I know, I know you're probably getting now. I just want to make sure everyone who's watching understands what we're talking about. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah okay. so, so Abdur Rahman said, so Abdur Rahman respo Rahman's response to her claim that he's impotent, he said, by Allah, Allah's, O Allah's apostle, she has told a lie. I am very strong and can satisfy her, but she is disobedient and wants to go back to Rifa. So she's saying, the reason I'm complaining about this man is because he's impotent. He can't satisfy me. And he says, that's false. I, I am very strong and I can satisfy her. The reason she's lying about me is she wants to go back to her her ex-husband. She doesn't like me, and she wants to go back to her ex-husband. And then here's what happened. Allah's apostle said to her, if that is your intention, in other words, if you want to go back to your former husband, then know that it is unlawful for you to remarry Rifa unless Abdur Rahman has had sexual intercourse with you. So notice he's catching her here, right? He says, you're saying he's impotent, but according to Sharia, you can't go back to your previous husband unless your current husband has had sex with you. You can't go back to that husband unless you've had sex again, but you're saying he's impotent. In other words, according to Sharia, if you're right, if you're right and he's impotent, then you're stuck with him beating you until your skin turns green because you're not you're not allowed to go back to your other husband husband. Then the prophet saw two boys with Abdur Rahman and asked him, are these your sons? On that, Abdur Rahman said, yes. The prophet said, you claim what you claim, i.e. that he's impotent. So he's saying, hey, uh, lady, you, you're saying that he's impotent, but these boys resemble him as a crow resembles a crow. So they look like their dad. Therefore, he's not impotent. Therefore, she's lying. And this is the end of the story. In other words, you're saying he had no reason for beating you, but he did have a reason for beating you. You're spreading lies and rumors about you, and therefore, case closed. And that's that's the end of the story. Okay, I see what you mean. Like, I do understand what you mean. Mm -hmm. 
or Wolf. So um, just 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 so we're on the same page here. She um, this woman was spreading lies, and then the person that then like her husband is spreading about her husband, and then her husband beat her because of her. That that that, the that that that's true. According according to the story, it sounds like she was lying about her husband. It sounds like she wanted to go back to another husband, so she was doing something wrong here. She's spreading a rumor about her husband being impotent she's going around telling all her friends hey my husband's impotent because she wants a divorce so she can go back to uh to her other husband and he gets angry about this beats her until her skin turns green aisha finds out about it aisha takes her to muhammad they want justice for this for this beating and muhammad's response is basically yeah but i i caught her i caught her lying so so that's and that again that's the yeah. end, that's the end of the story <clears throat> so muhammad you okay with it where did the prophet say that it was okay to be your wife in this hadith? He didn't say it's okay to be your wife. Well, he no, didn't say no, it's no, not okay, right? Yeah, no, no, no Muhammad. Well, he, he, said it's, he said it's not okay in another hadith. He no, said he didn't. Say, Can I read another hadith where a man slapped his wife in the face and then Allah said down the verse? And Muhammad read, said, you know what? Well, let, can, let me read, read the other one. First. Can I read the hadith first? It says yeah, it's yeah. In Sahih Muslim, the best among you is the one who treats his family the best, and I am the one who treats his family the best. Okay, now can so I correct you on for... your misinterpretation of Sai Muslim? Because someone who treats his family the best also disciplines his children when they're unruly. So that means if your child is bad, you don't discipline them? That means you're not a good father? What do you, so you that can... hadith doesn't prove your case. In fact, it actually proves the opposite point. Let me explain to you what it means. The one who's best to his family will not just provide for his family, care for his family, but also make sure his family is ruly and in submission to Allah's will because when they act out of line, then they get disciplined. Is it not true that if you have a son who doesn't pray by the age of 10, what do you do to him? Uh, what do you do to him? Is, is, well, like, well, wait, 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 how can you hit your son if you're the best to your family? So you're misinterpreting the hadith. It's not helping your case. So like, can I give you now the occasion why chapter 4 verse 34 was quote unquote can, revealed? Can, can I give it to you? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, come on. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is from Ali ibn Ahmed al Wahdi, Asbab al Nuzul. Asbab al Nuzul. Right? So this is Asbab al Nuzul. You can even read it online for free. Al Tafsir.com. A L T A F S I R.com. Now, if David wants to look for it online, chapter 4, verse 34, he can put it up on the screen because I'm going to quote it. So, but here, let me read for you carefully why this was quote unquote revealed. Wait, Sam, quote, Sam, Sam, what, 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 are you, what are you quoting here? I was reading comments. Okay. Yeah, in eltafsir.com, the one online. Oh, yeah. Eltafsir, you know that, right? Yeah. And there's the one with uh, Wahidi? Asbab al-Nuz. Wahidi, yeah. If you go to 434, it's right there, so yeah, you can yeah, see I'll pull, it. I'll pull it up. Um, let's see. The tafsir, just give me about 10 seconds. Sure. And so people don't think I'm... Four. And it's, I think it's like uh, it, it continues on to the next page because it has uh, more than one narration. But you'll see it. And as you bring it up, I can read if you want. I can't find it. All right. You can read it. Yeah, get there. You'll see. All right, I got so, it. Okay, all right. So um, when women, you see where it says men are in charge of women, right? Let, let me, uh, one second. Yeah, yeah, let me get Sorry, it up on guys. the screen. You're good, you're good, you're good. And yeah, all right, I got yeah. it up on the screen. All right, Sayyid Muqattal. You see it right there? It says uh, Sayyid Muqattal. I think that, hey, Sam, I think that's just said. Uh, well, they would pronounce it. Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm saying said. I think he's just saying Muqattal said this. Oh, even yeah, not better. a name. Yeah, you're right. You got it. See? You got me. Yeah, it's <laughs> good. That's true. Hey, let it go down in history. David David Wood destroys Sam Shamoon live. Here's the thing. Grammatically, you would say Muqattal said, and there is an Arabic name that's Sayyid that's spelled that way in English. So it's hello, too late, Sam. You've been schooled. Me. You've been schooled. Yeah. But anyway, with that said, Muqattal said. All right. This verse, men are in charge of women, was revealed about Sa'ad bin al-Rabbi, who was one of the leaders of the helpers, Nuqabba, and his wife Habiba bin Zayed bin Abi Zuhair, both of whom from the helpers, meaning Ansari. It happened, Sa'ad hit his wife on the face because she rebelled against him. Then her father went with her to see the prophet. He said to him, I gave him my daughter in marriage, and he slapped her. The prophet said, let her have retaliation against her husband. As she was leaving with her father to execute retaliation, the prophet called him and said, come back. Gabriel has come to me. And Allah exalted as he revealed this verse. 
the Messenger of Allah said, we wanted something while Allah wanted something else, and that which Allah wants is good. Retaliation was then suspended. Now, I don't want to read the rest of it, we can't. But Muhammad, you saw that when the man slapped her in the face, Muhammad said, okay, go back, go get your vengeance. But then the verse came down saying, no, she cannot get retaliation. There is no eye for an eye. The man was, was in his right to slap her in the face. And Muhammad said, hey, this is what Allah wants, Allah gets. So Muhammad is now condoning a man slapping his wife in the face, not just lightly tapping her with a miswak, a toothbrush. So are you okay with this? Um, let me, let me say in Islam, if you um, hit someone or oppress someone or do anything like that, um, on the day of judgment, um, if the person that you oppressed, their, their deeds will be transferred to the one who was oppressed. Not a and then the point, no, let, him, let him finish then. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. But and then the one who... And then the one who was oppressed, their sin is transferred to the, the to the oppressor. So maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this face down so that um on the day of judgment he can the, the one who is oppressed can get um the sins of the oppressor. Okay. Why are you reading into Muhammad's statement in the Quran motives that the Quran doesn't tell you? Are you like omniscient or a prophet? Did you receive Wahi to tell me maybe? No, no, but I'm not so like why are you he... reading too much into this? The the plain reading because it's your prophet now. Now you're trying to interpret your prophet for me, who's now telling me why this verse was revealed. The man slapped his wife in the face, and Muhammad said retaliation, but then the Quran came down, no, 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 she cannot retaliate because that's his right, because chapter 4, verse 34, doesn't say what you said. It says 434, a man has the right to slap a woman, to beat a woman whom he fears rebellion. So Allah is saying, no, he's justified. Now, you read out of it something that's not stated. Well, maybe Allah is allowing a woman to be beaten. So, in other words, this is what you just did, Muhammad. I want you to pay attention. It's okay for a woman to be beaten unjustly because she'll receive her reward with Allah. So, Allah is going to let women be beaten and mistreated like animals because, after all, on the Day of Judgment, then they will be vindicated. Come on, Muhammad. Let's not go there. Let's keep it plain. Do you now agree that that argument that Muhammad is a moral example because he didn't hit women. Let's put that aside. Can we go to some, because that's not going to work. Can we go now down to blacks and slave, uh, uh, race? Yes, okay, okay. because that's not going to work. Now, Dave, you want to say something about the issue of racism and blacks, or you want me to open it up? Um, so so, so now we're moving on. That's actually good. And, and yes. by, by, by the way, uh, um, I think I think it's clear to everyone, uh, Muhammad uh, Sharif here is being very, uh, very cool and very respectful. So we yes, just want to uh, we just want to say that that uh, whatever else happens in this discuss discussion, it's been a calm, uh, friendly discussion. Even though we 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 understand yep. how sensitive these issues can bring, we understand if we're pointing out things from the Quran and the Hadith, and we're criticizing Muhammad, we understand how that uh, how that comes across to a Muslim. So we we appreciate that everything has has been uh, has been calm and friendly here, um, and that and that uh, everyone's been respectful. Uh, so, on, uh, I I am getting requests. I also um, oh, go ahead. if you don't mind, I just want to um, say thanks to David Wood for like giving people the opportunity to go live with him and speak for Muhammad. Excellent. And um, yes. I don't know if people know this, but um, I live it like I live in the UK, and that is two AM right now. Oh yeah. For me. Yeah, it's oh, pretty nice. late right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty late. Okay, let's well, deal with the racist issue before we. Yeah, well, yeah, so, Dave, what do you want? You want to begin, or you want well, to? Well, 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 Sam. The the claim is the the, the standard claim. When, when whenever whenever we find uh, whenever Muslims comment on Muhammad being against racism, they basically give two two examples over and over again. One is Muhammad's uh, final uh, final sermon, where he said there's there's no difference between you know Arab and non-Arab and so on. Um, and then also the other example is Bilal. So there was a there was a yeah, yeah. there was a black companion named Bilal, um, and the you know the problem with the Bilal story is that Abu Bakr this was Abu Bakr was purchasing him not because he thought that slavery was wrong or that black slavery was wrong but exactly. because it was a Muslim under the control of a non-Muslim, so he purchased Bilal and what did he buy him with? Do you do you know what he bought him with? He bought him he bought, he bought him with uh, he bought him with multiple black slaves. So oh, yeah, he, he purchased him for for that. Um, I want to read more based on that. Actually, it was um. Um, I don't mean to be like um, you know, like a bit of a idiot, but like not not, not idiot, but like I don't mean to be like um, annoying and stubborn, but like is he he bought some with them um, ten gold coins. He did what? 
I can't hear you. He's, up, he's, but... he's, he's saying he purchased him with 10 gold coins, and you do find some inconsistencies. You have uh, one source says he bought him with a black slave, another with uh, multiple black slaves, I believe a husband and a wife, and he's quoting another source here. But, sure, that's fine. Uh, yeah. Let me go to the ones that are not disputed because he's still a black slave. Now, I'm going to read some hadith for you, Muhammad. This is Sa'il Bukhari, Sa'il Bukhari, volume okay. two, if you want to open it up because you last time you opened the other one. It's volume two, number 103. Sad Bukhari, volume two, number 103. I'm going to read it. Let me read it. And then wait, wait, wait. Turn it. I can't hear 103? Anybody. Yeah, no, it's volume two, number 103. Okay. Okay, now, narrate Urwa on the authority of Aisha. I got a couple of them. We're going to go slow one at a time. On the day of Minna, and then it says 11, 12, 13th of Dhul uh, Hijjah, Abu Bakr came to her while two young girls were beating the tambourine. And the Prophet was lying covered with his clothes. Abu Bakr scolded them, and the Prophet uncovered his face and said to Abu Bakr, Leave them, for these days are the days of Eid and the days of Minna. Aisha further said, now here's the part, Once the Prophet was screening me, and I was watching the display of black slaves in the mosques. And Omar scolded them. The Prophet said, Leave them, O Bani Arf Arfida. Carry on, you are safe. So in the mosque, they were displaying black slaves, and it even gives the color, and there's more hadith. Now, can you ask me, uh, answer me, what in the world is Muhammad doing allowing black slaves to be paraded? How come they were not emancipated, <clears throat> freed? And why do the hadith emphasize their color? And there's more than one hadith that said the black slave, the black slave, and I got a couple more, but I want you to explain this one. Why is your prophet justifying black slavery he didn't say it's okay though he's saying that he's watching the so they're, display, it's okay. they're displaying them in the mosque and he doesn't say shame on you what are you doing black slaves set them free in fact he rebukes umar for complaining that they're being displayed hey umar shut up leave them alone and you're saying he didn't condone it you want me to give you verses where he owned black slaves and they served them who but um Muhammad owned black slaves or Omar? Yes, Muhammad did. You want me to give it to you? Yes, please. Okay. Now, let me give you what he did with, with buying and selling. I'm going to give you a couple, but now, again, this is... Do you have Sai Muslim or no? Uh, no. Okay, well, anyway, you're going well, to have he, to take... He, 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 could, he, could he could find it online. He could write down the yes, references yeah, yeah. And, and find it okay, online. Okay, so yeah, Sai Muslim, number 3901. Sai mm -hmm. Muslim, number 3901. So remember the number. It's number okay. 3901. Got it, got it. Okay, narrated it, Jabir ibn Abdullah, Jabir ibn Abdullah, there came a slave and pledged allegiance to Allah's apostle on migration. He, the prophet, did not know that he was a slave. Then there came his master and demanded him back, whereupon Allah's apostle said, sell him to me. And he bought him for two black slaves. Your prophet gave two black slaves in exchange of that slave. So where did he get two black slaves from? And why is he purchasing a slave for two black slaves. He's giving him two black slaves for that one slave. And he did not afterwards take allegiance from anyone until he had asked him whether he was a slave or a free man. So now I want to ask you the question. Where did your prophet have two black slaves to give in exchange for that slave? This is like, um, you have to understand, like this is like um, in the Arabian culture at this time, people exchanging black slaves. So in order for Muhammad to get something, he obviously had to get black slaves. So like, you admit he had black slaves then? Yeah. Okay, good. But now, but now, here's the problem, though, Muhammad. Didn't you just say earlier he did away with a culture practice like infanticide with young girls? So here again, you're saying it was culture at that time to own black slaves. And so Muhammad is simply following this custom, even though he could have abolished it, said, hey, no more slaves, especially no more black slaves. He didn't do that. He continued the practice. But my question for you is, why does the Hadith mention their skin color? What's the deal with their skin color? Why black? Why not just say slave? Why black slave? Okay, listen. Um, let's um, say for argument's sake. What if Muhammad didn't have these black slaves? Then how would he get things? He needs to exchange things, like because he if he wants something, like if he wants something, then um, he has to exchange. But then if he has no black slaves, what can he use to exchange? If that, do you know what I mean? Muhammad. So you mean in chapter four, verse sixty-five of the Quran, where it says true Muslims have to perfectly submit to Muhammad's decisions. He couldn't have simply said. I am the messenger of Allah, you believe in me, you must perfectly submit to me, give me this man, set him free, because we don't own slaves. He couldn't have done that? What if he wasn't a Muslim? Say it again? 
if the guy was not if the guy was not Muslim. Okay, you could have told the guy he would say, "Look, we don't we don't own slaves. We've abolished slavery. So I'll buy this man and set him free. Why can he, he do doesn't that? own slaves? He, not we." He Muhammad, no, I'm answering your question, so you're not listening. You're saying, what if the man isn't a Muslim? So then Muhammad could say to that man, look, here, we don't own slaves, so I'll buy this man from you and set him free. Couldn't he have set him free? Yeah. And he didn't? No. Okay. And you still want us to believe he's a moral example? He's, he, he's a moral example. Okay. You want me to give you another hadith uh, where let, Omar walks in? Oh, Sam, God. let me. Uh, I just yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, I just wanted to bring up. Let's see if I can get this on the screen real quick. I just wanted to bring up uh, one of the passages because again, you have a passage um, saying uh, in Ibn Asak saying that Bilal was bought for for a, a, another black slave, and then I believe I forget. Don't don't quote me on this, but I believe it's Ibn Saad that says two black slaves. But let me see if I can get. I'm going to suck up on the screen here. So uh, here up in the upper left corner, ladies and gentlemen, we see this passage. Hisham bin Urwa told me on the authority of his father, Waraka bin Nafal was passing him uh, while he was uh, being thus tortured and saying, one, one, and he said, one, one, by God, Bilal. Then he went to Umayyah and those of Banu Juma who had thus maltreated him and said, I swear by God that if you kill him in this way, I will make his tomb a shrine. One day Abu Bakr passed by. Now we're getting to uh, this part. One day Abu Bakr passed by while they were thus ill-treating him for his house was among this clan. He said to Umayyah, have you no fear of God that you treat this poor fellow like this? So... Um, talking about him, him beating his Muslim slave, Bilal. Have you no fear of God that you treat this poor fellow like this? How long is it to go on? He replied, you are the one who corrupted him, so save him from his plight that you see. I will do so, said Abu Bakr. I have got a black slave, tougher and stronger than he, who is a heathen. I will exchange him for Bilal. The transaction was carried out, and Abu Bakr took him, and freed him. So notice, this was not about uh, slavery being a problem. It was not about black slavery being a problem. This was the the sole issue here was that a pagan, a polytheist, had control over a Muslim, and in order to buy the Muslim, so that a Muslim was not under the control of a pagan, of a polytheist, Abu Bakr sold. Uh, sold this man for Bilal, sold, gave him, traded him another black slave, or depending on the source, multiple black slaves. So notice, there's a man who is notorious for beating his black slaves. And Abu Bakr says, but don't beat that slave because he's a Muslim. You cannot do that. Here, I'll give you this other black slave. And he's a heathen, so I don't care what you do to him. And so hands him over. So yeah, my only point here is this This has a lot more to do yeah. with being a Muslim under the control of a non-Muslim than uh, Islam yeah. having a problem with, with black slavery. So that was all the point. And, and yeah, you could go ahead and... Let uh, me read one more, just one more hadith for him. Just one more and let him come. Okay. I, I wanna, this is now, if you have Sal Bukhari, open up volume 8. Sal Bukhari, volume 8, uh, okay. number 182. Sal Bukhari, volume 8, number 182. When you're there, let me know. It's number, volume 8, number 182. So I can read it, but let me know. Narr narrated Anas bin Malik. So, are you there? Mm, yeah. Okay. So you see, you see, it says narrated Anas bin Malik, right? Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm not one. Yeah, volume eight, number one eighty-two. So it's volume eight, book seventy-three, number one eighty-two. Narrated Anas bin Malik. It should be there, and if not, I'll just read it. It's there. I gave okay. you the reference. Um. So you got yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, narrated Anas bin Al, pay attention. Allah's apostle was on a journey, and he had a black slave, again it says black, called An Anjasha. And he was driving the camels very fast, and there were women riding on the camels. Allah's apostle said, Wai haqqa, may Allah be merciful to you, O Anjasha. Drive slowly with the glass vessel. So here is a black slave that your prophet owned, that he had him drive the camels. So do you acknowledge your prophet was a white man who owned black slaves? He owned black slaves, yes, he did. Okay, so, all right. So then you're okay with a white prophet because Adi says he's white, right? Do I need to show you that or you, you know that? 
No, yeah, like, I, I you know he's white, right? Okay, but yeah, I just want, okay, good. So you have a white man who owns black slaves, and the Hadiths make it a point to emphasize they were black slaves, so he was a white black slave owner, a white slave owner of blacks. Yeah, and, and like okay. I said before, this is like I said before, this is like culture. If you know what I mean, he had to, in order to buy something and get something, he needed to have the actual currency, and the currency is black people. Okay, all right. Uh, now, can I talk about black people in Day of Judgment? Yeah. All right. Well, okay, I'm going to read to you. <clears throat> You're going to have to find this online on Sunnah.com. It's a Tirmidhi. A Tirmidhi. So, but let me read it for you. It's number 38 in the Alim. It's, you can find it on alim.org, O-R-G, the alim.org, A-L-I-M dot O-R-G, okay. Tirmidhi collection. They have a translation. It's number 38. And then I want to read from Mishkat al-Masabih. But let me read it slowly. Are you ready? No, wait there. Okay. Are you going to go online to find it? Yes, yeah, I'm doing. Okay, if you go to alim.org and their Hadith collection, find Tirmidhi. Okay, number 38 it's going to be a while to find it when you get there you can find because I want to make sure you see it so you know I'm not making anything up Up, okay hmm. number 38 of Tirmidhi and alam.org it's alam.org number 38 got it okay can I read it now yeah it should be narrated Abu Darda you see that yes Allah's messenger said Allah created Adam when he had to create him and he struck his right shoulder and then emitted from it white offspring as if they were white ants. He struck his left shoulder and there emitted from it the black offsprings as if they were charcoal. He then said to those who had been emitted from the right shoulder, meaning the white, for paradise and I do not mind. Then he said to those who had been emitted from the left shoulder, they are for hell and I do not mind. So you just read the hadith. From the right shoulder of Adam, he created white race, and he says, for paradise. From the left, he created black offsprings, and he said, these blacks are for hell. Why in the world is your God, Allah, saying, I'm going to create black people from Adam for hell, and I'm going to create white people from Adam for paradise? This, I think, I'm, I don't think this is authentic, because it, it even says in Hadith that, um, Bilal ibn he's, he was uh, he was a black slave as you discussed. He'll he he actually he will go to paradise. He's going to go to paradise. Wait, the, um, I'm just gonna read the hadith again. You know, I know the hadith, but that's not that didn't respond prove it because you know why? According to chapter three, verse one hundred eight, every black slave that was good will be turned into white. According to chapter three, verse one hundred eight, so he's gonna change his skin color. You're not making your case. That's chapter 3, verse 108. Maybe. The people who enter paradise will be white, and those who go to hell will be black. So the black slave will be changed into a white man, and those who go to hell, even if they're white, they'll be changed into black. Even 3106. I'm sorry. Chapter 3, verse 108. Okay. No, he wanted the hadith. Chapter 3, verse 106. I see your point. And then the black stone, it was it's a stone that came from paradise. It came white. But then because of the sins of the people, it turned black. And at the same time, black is like the, like the color of dust. Like the color of dust and death. So you see my and don't point. get me wrong. Good. I'm not saying, and please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that black people are like dirty or not. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that death is black. Can we agree on that? Uh, I'm not a Muslim. I can't agree with that. But all I'm no, trying no, to no. say with you. No, no, I'm saying death is black. Most, most of the time, death is black. Okay. If you want to compare it to that, I mean, I don't know what to say. I don't know. Okay. But, just, yeah. but keep to the point, though. You said, you see my point, because even the stone that was white turned black. So now you're admitting that a black man will be turned into a white man to enter paradise. And even a white man who's evil will turn into a black man to go to hell because black, that color black, signifies evil, dirt, and sin. No, it, it, I'm sorry. That, that's not true. Okay, so why are... If that's why what the says... If that's what the hadith says, that's not hadith is not authentic. I'm well, where does it? Oh, hold on, give me the classification. It's, it doesn't say it's not authentic. Where did you get it's not authentic? If the hadith says that people are black, like uh, I'm, I'm gonna be turned to, to hell, that's not authentic. Mm, you can't make up the classification as you go along. It is authentic. It's not only in Tirmidhi. It's also in Mishkat al-Masabi, and it was translated by 
um, Ahmed ibn Hanbal. I can give you the Mish so it's there. You can't just make it up the way you want. I mean, you don't like it, that's okay, but these are your sources. It says what it says. I mean, I'm just quoting it. So, but you have a problem with that, so let me give you a final one then. Just one, one more. Let's put that aside because you had a problem with that one. This Have you heard of Kadi Iyad, Musa al Yahsubi, the Kadi? No. No, no. He, he wrote the book Ash Shifa. Ash Shifa is, is actually a manual recommended by the ulama like Hamza Yusuf. Don't take my word for it. Do a search. Kadi Iyad, Musa al Yahsubi. He's a Kadi. He wrote a book called Ash Shifa, the healing that comes from honoring Mustafa, meaning your prophet. So, this is a manual recommended by Muslim scholars to read on the rights of Muhammad that every Muslim owes to Muhammad. And he's not quoting his opinion, he's quoting other sources, even the Sahaba and the uh, Tabiun. But with that said, let me read to you what he says, okay? This is now in the English translation of his book. It's Muhammad, Messenger of Allah, Ashifa of Kadi Iyad, by Aisha Abdurrahman Buley. Aisha Abdurrahman Buley. It was even published in Scotland, UK, Medina Press, okay? So you can find this online on Amazon if you don't believe me. Page 375. Are you with me now? So I can read it? Yeah, I'm um, with it. Okay. Page 375. Ahmed ibn Abi Suleiman, the companion of Sahnun, said anyone, pay attention now, anyone who says that the Prophet was black should be killed. Now let me read page 387. Page 387. Ahmed ibn Abi Suleiman, Sahnun's companion, said, that whoever says that the Prophet was black is killed. The Prophet was not black. Why do you kill a man for saying your Prophet is black? Why not just say, hey, no, he's a white man, don't call him black. Why kill him? That's, um, I think personally that's wrong. You, you, you shouldn't kill someone because of that. But that's not, like, that's not, that's not, like, directly from the Prophet. That's not from the Prophet. That's from someone, that's from someone else saying that about the Prophet. That's not what it's the Prophet a is saying. Uh, see, Muhammad. You're not a Qadi, I'm not a Qadi, you're not a Mufti, I'm not a F Mufti, you're not an Alam, I'm not an Alam. This man is a Qadi. He's a recognized, renowned Muslim scholar and an expert at jurisprudence. He's simply giving the, <clears throat> the rulings by the Muslim scholars, the ulama. It's not his opinion. He's saying, this is what happens to those who do X, Y, and Z. If you curse the Prophet, you are killed. If you say he's black, you are killed. He's not giving... That's wrong. I condemn... I condemn anyone who kills someone f for n no reason. That's why I condemn. I condemn no, anyone. No, it's not no reason. It's insulting your prophet and saying that he's a false prophet or he's immoral or he's black. So it's no. I'm not saying no reason. They're saying there is a reason. You cannot in Sharia. You cannot insult the prophet or you're going to die. Are you telling me that's not true? In Sharia, can I insult the prophet and not be killed if I'm living in an Islamic state? No, you will. I will what? You said you will. But at the same time. I will be killed, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just be, I mean, that's why I respect yeah. you, honestly, you're being honest. So in an Islamic state, David Wood and I saying Muhammad is false prophet, we're killed, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. You're, I, you know, I, your respect now went to the roof. You know how much I respect you? Because you're so honest, honestly. I appreciate you. Thank you so Thanks. much. You're honest. All right, he's honest. David, you want to take over today? That's it. I mean, the, the, even um. that case. I'm a racist, so I don't know what else to say. Yeah, th this kind of leads into another... Uh, topic that uh, that Muhammad here brought up. He said that when when people insulted Muhammad, he just remained silent. He let Abu Bakr respond, uh, tying no, no, it. No. What's that? Go ahead. Sorry, um, I didn't say he let Abu Bakr respond. He just said silent. He didn't tell Abu Bakr to respond. Abu Bakr responded on his own will, and that's when the prophet okay. he was upset because he responded. So your. Um, so, but you're saying you're saying that it's good. It's good because Muhammad didn't respond when people insulted him. The the the, re, the reason I'm the reason I'm bringing this up is so Sam uh, Sam quoted Qadi Iyad saying that if someone calls Muhammad black, it's a death sentence. He he is to be killed. You pointed out that you would reject that because Muhammad didn't say, "Hey, if someone calls me black, then then kill him," uh, but. Sam pointed out that no, it's because that was regarded as an insult in the Muslim community, and it is, it is a ruling in the Muslim community that 
if someone insults Muhammad, then that's a death sentence. And I would say that does go back to Muhammad himself, that if yep. someone if someone insults him, then it's a death sentence. And so the reason I, I was I was I, I think that's a good segue into the other topic you brought up that when Muhammad was insulted, then he, he didn't retaliate. Uh, Abu Bakr spoke up for him, but Muhammad just remained silent. Muhammad may have just remained silent at certain points when he was powerless over certain people. But once he came to power, once he rose to power, then the penalty became so-and-so made fun of me, therefore so-and-so had to die. So yep. it's, it, the, the, the actual Islamic position is more like this. When Muslims are in the minority, when they're totally outnumbered, and if they get violent, they will be crushed and destroyed by their enemies, then don't retaliate if someone criticizes Muhammad. But when the Muslim community becomes stronger and they're the most powerful force around, then if someone criticizes Muhammad, makes fun of Muhammad, mocks Muhammad, then that person is to be sentenced to death. And that's the example that Muhammad himself gave. That doesn't come from a, a later Muslim scholar, or a later Muslim ruler. That comes from Muhammad himself. It's Muhammad who says, hey, we're in the minority. Uh, if they want to insult me, nothing we can do about it. But later on, when Muhammad rises to power, it was, hey, remember all those people who insulted me? Here's a list. Go kill them. And so that's, uh, I, I don't know if you're once again going to say, but yeah. you know, that's that's the culture or something like that. But if you're, pu here's the point. If you're putting it forward to say, that the reason Muhammad was not violent and the reason that we know Muhammad was moral is that when people insulted him or abused him, he did not retaliate. He just remained silent. Well, Muhammad did that when it was convenient for him. But later, when he was more powerful, he did retaliate and he said, you have to be killed. It was a death sentence. It was a death penalty. So in other words, the point here is if you're saying that Muhammad not retaliating is proof that he's moral and nonviolent, then what do you do with Muhammad commanding his followers to execute people for making fun of him? Wouldn't this then prove the opposite? And this is why I went back, you know, this is why I started off with the example of John Wayne Gacy. Of course, you can look at even an American serial killer and say, look at all these nice, wonderful things he did. You can't ignore the big picture of the rest of the things he did, especially if the question is whether John Wayne Gacy is violent. You can't say, of course, he's not violent. He was so nice at this child's birthday party. Well, he wasn't nice when he was raping and killing these young boys, right? So you ha you can't ignore those things. So, He's so, laughing too. So, the, so, yeah, so the only thing I'm pointing out here is if we're trying to uh, assess whether Muhammad was peaceful or violent, yes, we can say, we can say Muhammad was peaceful in certain instances, but we can't then ignore instances where uh, where he, he ordered his followers to kill and execute people for leaving Islam or for making fun of him or for criticizing the religion and, and things like that. But what, what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, uh, if he wants, I can give him hadith if he's questioning it. Do you want hadith or do you agree with what David said? That he had people killed who mocked him. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So, um, um, one thing I said is that like, um, the Prophet, even when he was in power, he didn't say kill anyone who actually insulted me. And and my one last point, where can I find it? Yeah. It's, um, can you, um, um, in Islam, in my religion, there's things that you can, there's, there's things I can do that can get you killed. Is that right? I can hear you. What What's was that? that? There's certain sins that you can do in Islam that can get you killed. Yes, there's, yeah, we know that. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's, there's sin, there are well, sins, it, sins it, in Islam that will get you killed. Yes. And is, and it, is that wrong? That's wrong, right? I I don't know. You have to be specific. I don't know. I mean, if Islam is true. If it's from God and God says, don't do this or you'll be punished, then who's to argue against God? But that's the question. Is he a prophet of God? But before we go there, Muhammad, you said you said again, I just want to make sure I heard you. Muhammad, even when he was in power, never ordered anyone to be killed because they mocked him? Yeah. That's no, that's no, that's not true. I have the references. Do you want me to read them for you? I, I have, uh, and also Sam, I have, uh, I have Ibn Asak uh, pulled up here yes. to to give some so examples. You, and you have Asma bint Marwan and others. So I don't know which one you want to give him. You can give him. Do you want to give him Asma bint Marwan? Um, I, I'm I'm talking here about when they conquered Mecca and they said, look, even, oh yeah, yeah, you know, even if uh, yeah. So so let's just let's just look at a couple of examples on this page, and there 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 are more. There are more examples of people being um, executed. But uh, this is this is just the first one that popped into my head. Let me see if I can let me see if I can get yeah. this up here. 
Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. So even when he's in power, he had people killed. Yeah, so, so I, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so we can see uh, can here. You tell me, like, can you tell me where it is? Because obviously, like, um, I'm not watching from the last few. I'm watching from the Skype call. Yeah, you, so could, you, can, like... you can jot this down, but this is uh, Ibn Asak's Sirat Rasulullah. So this is Ibn Asak, pages 550 to 551. We'll just look at a couple of examples. We're not going to read the entire passage here. We'll, we'll just look at a couple of examples. You know, I'll, I'll come to the last few. Yeah, and yeah. then when you give him that example, I can give him the example Kab Ibn al Ashraf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so right here we have uh, Ibn Asak and uh, down at the bottom pa bottom paragraph on the left hand of the of the page, we have an example. And basically, what what the situation is that Muslims are conquering Mecca, and some people are going to be okay. Some people are going to be forgiven, but Muhammad gives a list of people who have to die and are to be shown no mercy. So. Uh, Another was, so in this bottom paragraph, another was Abdullah bin Qatal of Banu Tayyim bin Ghalib. He had... What? Uh, what's that? You know what? Abdullah means in Arabic. Yeah, slave of Allah. But yeah. uh, he still so got if him, they are ordering the slave of Allah to be killed, what does that... No, 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 no. no. That well, no, no the, yeah, the, this guy's an apostate. I'll finish, 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 yeah, finish, yeah. finish off. Yeah, this, this, finish is, off. this isn't even about him. You could, you could make a good argument that Abdullah deserved to die here. So he had become a Muslim, and the apostle sent him to collect the portex in company with one of the Ansar. He had with him a freed slave who served him. So this guy was a Muslim, and Muhammad sent him to collect the zakat with one of the Ansar. Uh, he had with him a freed slave who served him. He was a Muslim. So the, so the man here is a Muslim, and the uh, freed slave with him is a Muslim. When they halted, he ordered the latter to kill a goat for him and prepare some food and went to sleep. When he woke up, the man had, I believe it's going to say, done nothing. Um, oops, let me see. Get up to the top here. The man had done nothing, so he attacked and killed him and apostatized. So this man killed another man. So that's why I said you could make a case that this person deserved to die because he killed another man basically over not getting his food ready. But here, here, here's, here's the follow-up. He had two singing girls, Fartana and her friend, who used to sing satirical songs about the apostle. So he ordered that they should be killed with him. So the one guy, Abdullah here, was under a death sentence for apostatizing and for killing a Muslim, a freed Muslim slave. So this guy was under a death penalty, but then it, it gives this follow-up and said he had two singing girls, Fartana and her friend, who used to sing satirical songs about the apostle. So these girls used to sing songs making fun of Muhammad. And notice, so he ordered that they should be killed with him. So this is Muhammad ordering, hey, yeah, we, we know we have to kill Abdullah, but make sure you kill his singing girls, his singing girls, because they used to sing songs making fun of me. Now, this passage goes on. By the way, one of the girls was pardoned by, uh, by a different Muslim uh, when they actually caught her. One, of, one was sentenced to death. I mean, one of, them, one of them was actually killed. But you have multiple examples. Yeah. But look, look at the very next example. Another was al Huwairith. One of those who used to insult him at Mecca. So the the reasons that these people are being killed over and over again in many instances here is that they were making fun of Muhammad. So Muhammad saying, "Hey, so notice what notice what the situation is. When Muhammad was this uh, outnumbered prophet in Mecca, then these people are making fun of him. They're insulting him, and he's not going out and fighting them. And Muslims look at that and they say, "You see, these people insulted him, and Muhammad didn't even retaliate." Well, keep reading. Once Muhammad had power over them, and he was the most powerful force, he kept he kept these people in mind and said, "Hey, remember all those people who made fun of me? Remember those girls who made fun of me and sang songs? Remember this per this person who insulted me? Now you go and execute these people." So it wasn't like he he just let it slide or he thought it was okay. Yeah. It was just, "Hey, I'm not in a position to execute you now, so I'm going to let you slide. Later on, when I can, I'm going to kill you." And so this is the pattern that that places like Pakistan right now, which have blasphemy laws, these are the passages, and there are more, but these are the passages that they look to when they say, hey, if you speak against Muhammad, if you criticize Muhammad, if you, you know, if you mock Muhammad, then you have to die. Why? Because that goes back to Muhammad, and that's why, in Qadi mm -hmm. Iyad, that's why, as long as the Muslim community regards calling Muhammad black as an insult, 
then that's why they can say that you are put to death for calling Muhammad black. Yeah. Muhammad, before you respond, I want to give you one from Bukhari because you have access to it. Because he read Ibn Ashaq, and you may not be able to see it, but he's got it on screen so you can check it later. He's not misquoting. But you have Bukhari, right? Uh, yeah. Let me give you two, but one from Bukhari because I want you to be able to read something for yourself. Because David just put the image on the comp uh, on the session, which is recorded, so you have to go back and find it. But this one, you don't need to look for it because you have Bukhari. Can you go to Sad Bukhari, Volume 5, number 369? Sad Bukhari, Volume 5, number 369, and when you get there. And then you can explain, because the pattern you're seeing here, what you're seeing here, Muhammad, is the pattern. Someone makes fun of Muhammad, disparages Muhammad, questions Muhammad's right to impose his rule, and Muhammad gets him killed. Because you said he didn't do that. Well, let's see. If you get there, let me know. Sal Bukhari, Volume 5, Number 369. You there? Okay. It starts out by saying, Nar Narrated Jabir bin Abdullah. You see that? Yeah. Okay. Allah's Apostle said, Who's willing to kill Kaab bin Al-Ashraf, who has hurt Allah and his Apostle? Thereupon, Muhammad bin Maslama got up saying, Oh, Allah's Apostle, would you like that I kill him? The Prophet said, Yes. Muhammad bin Maslama said, then allow me to say a thing, a false thing, i.e. to deceive Kaab. The Prophet said, you may say it. Now, before we finish it, pay attention to two things, Muhammad. Muhammad bin Maslama said, okay, well, you're going to have to allow me to trick him, to kill him. Muhammad, your Prophet said, you may say it. Instead of saying, no, we are slaves of Allah. We do not lie. We don't use trickery. He said, you're free. Do it. Now, let's continue. I'm not going to skip to the part because it's a lengthy one. Go to the part where it says, so... Muhammad bin Maslama went in together. Do you see that part? Okay. You'll get there. So Muhammad bin Maslama went in together with two men. You'll find it's in there because it's a long hadith. I, I didn't want to read it, quote all of it. It says, went to men and said to them, when Kaab comes, I will touch his hair and smell it. You see that? Okay. Let me know when you get there. You see it? So um, is this near the end or... It says, it should be, yeah, close to the end, right when he's about to kill him. It says, so Muhammad bin Maslama went in together with two men and said to them, when Kaab comes, I will touch his hair and smell it. And when you see that I've got hold of his head, strip him. I will let you smell his head. So oh, notice, yeah, yeah. Okay, you see it? Okay, yeah. let's read. I'm going to read it from there. So Muhammad bin Maslama went in together with two men and said to them, <clears throat> when Kaab comes, I will touch his hair because they're pre pretending to be his friends. So they're going to touch his hair. And smell it. And when you see that I have got hold of his head, strip him. I will let you smell his head. Kaab bin al-Ashraf came down to them wrapped in his clothes and diffusing perfume. Muhammad bin Maslama said, I have never smelt a better scent than this. Kaab replied, I have got the best. Arab women who know how to use the high class of perfume. Muhammad bin Maslama requested Kaab, will you allow me to smell your head? Kaab said, yes, Muhammad smelt it and made his companion smell it as well. Then he requested Kaab again, will you let me smell your head? Kaab said, yes. When Muhammad got a stronghold of him, he said to his companion, get at him. So they killed him and went to the prophet and informed him. Abu Rafi was killed after Kaab bin al-Ashraf. So you see the trickery? They pretended to be his friend. Oh, your hair smells so nice. And when he grabbed him by that, strike him. And they killed him dead using trickery. And your prophet said, go ahead and do it because he's hurt me. So wh where did you get that Muhammad did not kill those who mocked him, insulted him? And here not only did he order his follower to kill the man, he allowed him to deceive him. It's like me coming up to you. Oh, Muhammad, my friend, give me a hug. And when you hug me, I take the knife and I then stick it in your back and kill you dead. And this is the way of God. To be honest, eh, I'll consider this. Did, I didn't did the, but the Prophet Muhammad, he didn't, did, did the Prophet Muhammad order them, for, for, order them to trick him? Just trick read him. it. He said, he asked him, did you start the beginning? Who will kill this man? He goes, well, I will, but you're going to have to allow me to use deceit. He goes, you are free. You can do it. It says it right there in the beginning. We read it. That's true. You say it again. He said, that's true, right? Yeah. All right. So, my friend, 
All the examples you gave doesn't prove Muhammad is a prophet. It shows he's not a prophet worthy of your obedience. Time for you to come to Jesus Christ, your only hope of salvation. Well, Sam, ju just just to be Within clear, Jesus Christ, hey. yes. Sam, Jesus. One, 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 one sec, one second, Muhammad. I just wanted to, I just wanted to uh, to point something out, Sam. One thing, uh, th this particular topic wasn't about. Uh, whether Muhammad's a prophet, it's about whether he was immoral and wow. violent. So that was okay. actually what he wanted to address. So even these examples, even these examples uh, that uh, Muhammad gave weren't meant to show that Muhammad was a true prophet. They were to show that he wasn't yeah. violent Sorry and, about and immoral. Sorry, I thought he's I thought he's doing that to convince us he's a prophet. All right, well, okay. Well, you're wrong. You're wrong as usual, Sam. All right. Okay, All right, Muhammad, go ahead. Go ahead. What, 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 whatever point. Doesn't you're say in um, in um, Deuteronomy. Chapter 21, verse 22 to 23, and in the Bible, and if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any way, in any wise, bury him that day. Yeah. Yeah, and now if you yeah, if you want to apply it to Jesus, I can answer you very easily. But before no, wait, we go wait, there, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm just wondering what point he was making. Point. Maybe he's maybe he's pointing About out that Jesus. it's so. No, I don't know if what he's pointing out. I don't know. He may be pointing out that even according to yeah, the Bible, you sentence yeah, people to death. No, because if I'm a Greek call, because I said Jesus is Lord, mm -hmm. and that's why he started mentioning this. Yeah, Muhammad, what 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 point were you trying to make? Because we're confused here. Yeah, uh, kind of both. Oh, okay. Yeah, kind of both. So Jesus is like, okay, well, I can answer the part about Jesus, but when you, when here, when you read that in context, Deuteronomy 21, 22, 23, it's someone who breaks the law, a law that brings about capital punishment. No one has a problem with God establishing a theocracy on earth, meaning if God shows up, because now you brought that up, let me address it, then I will try to do it slowly so you can get the points so I don't confuse you. If you read the story of Deuteronomy from Exodus, God appeared in a pillar of cloud. People saw that cloud that appeared as a pillar of fire by night. <clears throat> Even the Egyptians saw it. The Israelites saw God split the Red Sea. They saw the pillar of cloud come down on the mountain. They heard the voice of God audibly. They saw Moses go into the pillar of cloud and receive commandments. So God showed them irrefutable proof. I am God. I am real. You're my people. Here's my covenant. You need to keep it. So when God goes out of his way to show that he's God and he's real and he's doing miracles that the Egyptians and the Israelites are seeing. And then he says, Israel, you're my people. I'm giving you the land. Here's the law. This is how you're going to run the land. If anyone fails to carry these commands, sometimes it's not death, but some commands bring death. That's a different story when God is setting apart a people to be his people on earth, to live in according with his command. After all he did to show them he's God and then they still dishonor him, then they deserve punishment. That's different from Muhammad shows up and he tells us he's a prophet, but no one saw God appear in front of multitudes like God appeared for Moses and Israel. No one saw any miracles he did to convince them that he's a prophet like Moses and establishing a Sharia similar to Moses. So we can get into that. That's a different story. But with Jesus, if you understand the gospel in Deuteronomy 21, 22 to 23, it says, if you break the law that brings about capital punishment, you are to be put to death and then read it. You then hang him on a tree as a warning to everyone else. Hey, look. If you Israelites, after seeing God doing miracles and splitting the Red Sea and feeding you miraculously in the desert for 40 years where you didn't die in the desert, if you then dishonor God and you break his command, then this will happen to you. So someone hanging on, the, on a tree was a sign. He's a lawbreaker and he was condemned. So how does that tie in with Jesus? Well, that's the message of the New Testament, Muhammad, that you and I, we broke the law of God. We deserve to die. Jesus steps in, and this is where you need to hear me. This is what we believe. I'm not saying you believe it. Jesus steps in and says, look, you broke the law. You deserve to die. But in my love, I will pay your debt. I will pay the debt of your sin. The debt of your sin is death. I will step in and die in your place. Take your punishment so now you can be forgiven if you repent. And that's why Paul quotes it. Because you're referring to Galatians 3, verses 10 to 13. Paul's point is, see, Jesus, who's sinless, who never broke the law, died on a tree as a sign for us. He took our curse and our punishment so we can be forgiven. That's why Jesus did it. He died on the cross as a sign. Look, Muhammad, this is how much I love you. You deserve to be on this tree. You're the one who's supposed to be put to death. You're the one who's supposed to be hanging here. 
but because I love you, I'm taking your place paying the debt of your sin, and I'm dying and hanging on a tree, so you don't have to if you turn to me and receive me so you'll be forgiven. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Jesus did for you and me what we could not do and died the death that you and me deserve so we could be spared and forgiven and live. So that's good news. So hopefully you'll accept it. Mohammed, you there? Uh oh, did we lose Muhammad? Well, he'll, he'll call back. Well, unless his phone ran out of his right. phone ran well, out of battery or well, whatever. Perfect timing, right? He heard the gospel before it died. <laughs> <clears throat> Let me see. Anyway, we only got any like uh, fourteen minutes for this guy. I mean, so it's uh, we're only two hours, and it's, I guess it's late for him. Yeah, so Muhammad. Maybe he back up. Muhammad, I don't know if you can hear me, but we can't hear you right now. So uh, if yeah, you might need to hang up and then call back or something like that. I don't know. Again, I don't know if you can hear me right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we can give him a chance to wrap up if he wants because you know, yeah, it's been 12 Yeah, be, yeah be happy to give him a couple minutes to uh, to wrap up. And uh, let, let's go ahead and take a question or two um, while we wait and see if Muhammad can come back on. Uh, let's see. Here's one from Seeking the Narrow Way. It says, Beautiful. would Daniel... I don't know how to pronounce this last name. Hakikachu. Hakikachu. Well, that's the one that uh, debated apostate prophet. Yeah, yeah, I only, I only, uh, I kind of did a hit and run where I show up for like two minutes and and uh, and then leave like I do on your live streams all the time. But yeah, I was working on a video. But uh, would Daniel Hakikachu come on? He's the most honest Muslim I've ever heard. Um, I did what I did watch one of Daniel's videos. It was his one. Someone sent me a video and asked if I could address something an interesting thing he said about uh, lgbtq lgbtq so it was a video where he, where he was warning the muslim population about the spread of lbg lbgtq um but there's something interesting he said in that video anyway um yeah that guy sounds very very intelligent does not mean i agree with him i will probably disagree with most of what he says but that guy is uh, very, very intelligent and very well spoken. So, oh, I just got a, I got a text yeah. from from Muhammad. He said his connection went bad, but he can hear us. Uh, yeah, yeah, Muhammad. Oh, yeah. Now it says two of three in the call. So, yeah, go ahead and call back Muhammad Sharif, and we'll let you uh, close out when we're wrapping up. But yeah, seeking the narrow way. You're you are free. Everyone here, we we've announced that any Muslim in the world who wants to join us. Um, Muslim scholars, Muslim apologists, uh, every you know, average average Muslims on, on the street, Muslim students, anyone who wants to join us and have a discussion, we're happy yep. to have a friendly discussion. But if uh, Daniel would like to join us live, we are happy to give him about ten minutes to make his case for Muhammad. All our all our listeners can hear why we should believe in Muhammad, and then we'd be happy to have a discussion about about those reasons. Uh, because you're frozen now, yeah, I don't get yeah, it. It says we're frozen, so yeah, might might just be might be a bad connection. Uh, Sam, we'll go yeah. ahead and take a couple couple more questions, and then hopefully Muhammad can come back on and he can uh, just just so we can just so it's not like an abrupt an abrupt he said, ending uh, to the discussion. Is he is that him? No, that's somebody else. I thought it was him saying tell David extend it to next week. Oh, they're saying to extend extend again Muhammad week to next week. Well, uh, whatever God's we don't know. Maybe we'll take a break. We'll see. Let's see what God will do because he's got a lot on his plate and I do, but we'll see. But yeah, any questions? Any questions? Because this poor man has to wrap it up. Because remember, an hour ago it was two in the morning for him, so it's probably past three a.m. for him. And he hasn't slept, and he's going to end up praying anyway. So yeah. and then go to sleep. Uh, let me go ahead and say, uh, uh, he said he could hear us. So Muhammad, Muhammad, if you um, if you want to, if you can't get back on, and can't can't get back in the discussion. Uh, if you want to type, if you want to type something real quick, I'll go ahead and uh, and read it to everyone. Other than that, we can we can uh, we're happy to have Muhammad back on with us at some point. Wait, hang on, let me see. He's typing yeah, David he's, here. Yeah, hello, David. Uh, says I can hear you. My connection went bad. You are frozen now. Hello and David. Yeah. So Muhammad, I see, I see the text you're posting, but don't yeah. know how to get you back on. But you can yeah, try, yeah. you can try calling back if your connection. Yeah, if, and if better. you can't, 
uh, we were going to just let you make closing statements because it's almost two hours anyway. So if you can't, that's fine. But let us know if you can. If not, you want to say something, we'll pass it on and we'll wrap it up because it's already 10 minutes to 7. My time, but you, it's, uh, what, 10 minutes to 10. Yeah, so, so Mohammed, this says that you are not in the call anymore. So if you want to try calling back, then this should ring. This should ring. Matter of fact, let me go up. Let me go up here and see something. See, let me see, see if I can get. add someone to the call. Yeah, folks, that was, at least he got to hear over 90% of it, and he heard the gospel before his phone went out. Uh, I've actually challenged Shabir, and I've been hunting him the past two weeks. He even said, he told Itisham Gulam and others he won't debate me. That's okay. He's, he showed he won't debate me. Then let him be, because that, that's good enough for me. Muhammad, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we got him back. We got okay. him back. All right. All right, friend. Good. We're going to say that since it's been two hours in Slate Free, if you want to wrap up and say something, and we'll wrap it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to say um, it's been a, a quick discussion, obviously, because um, I personally, like, I enjoyed it because um, I, I enjoyed talking to you and um, I enjoyed learning more about, like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and and everyone that just so everyone yeah just so everyone knows uh, no no sh no shame in being sort of you know not a scholar and trying to have these exactly. discussions. It's actually you know you know we, we we invited we invited all Muslims on there. We had of course you know we had Doctor Shuaib Sayed and so on. Yeah, so he's this is a teenager saying that he's coming on with Sam Shamoon to discuss his views. So, um, yeah. so all respect for you. Yeah, all Muhammad. Respect. Yeah, we we respect you for keeping the entire discussion respectful. Uh, we res we definitely respect your courage. So I don't think anyone here would have anything but respect for you. So and exactly. if you ever if you ever want to join us again, uh, you're welcome back on to have a discussion. And you could you could bring you could bring a friend if you or your imam or if you have a if you have some friend you'd like to be on that that would that would be fine as well. Uh, before we close out, do you have anything else you'd like to say or anything else you'd like to say about uh, your prophet? Uh, no, not really. I okay. Think all right. Okay. And Muhammad, well, we pray that God will guide you into all truth and guide us into his truth and love because at the end, we want to be in God's presence forever. We don't want to die the enemies of God because it's not about winning arguments, Muhammad. Remember this. It's about living forever in the peace and joy of God and not being cut off from his presence. And our prayer is because we believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. He'll reveal himself to you because we want you to live forever in God's presence together as one family. And that's our prayer for you. God guide you and keep you. Oh yeah, um, um, excuse, um, sorry. Um, I was one last thing. David Wood, you um, a few months ago, you uploaded a video saying that if any Muslim answers your question, you will like you vow to take your shahada. Yeah. I think um, I, I've got the answer to your question. Okay. okay. You you asked what question? Yeah. Let, let me let me let me clarify. If 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 it's the one I'm thinking of, I said if any. If anyone can show me this, this won't be word for word, but you could tell me if this is correct. If anyone can show me where the Quran says that the gospel has been corrupted, I will bow down and recite the Shahada. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Right. So you got it for us. Good, 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 good. Let's go. This is actually, this is actually good. We don't mind going a couple, a couple minutes yeah, over yeah, if yeah. you want to discuss this. Mm -hmm. This is um, chapter three, verse 78 of the Quran. Says, and there is indeed a group among them who twist their tongues with the book, and this is and this is referring to the people of the book, so the Jews and the Christians, um, that you may that, that you may suppose it to be from the book, but it but if but it is not from it is not from the book, and they say it is from God, though it is not from God, and they normally speak a lie against God. Mm -hmm. that, now, that's it. Yeah. No, yeah. And there's there's um, uh, one more. In, um, sir, two verse, four. sir. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to. Two, I thought you were going to two seventy nine. Go ahead. No, he went to chapter three for seventy eight, which we. No, no, no. I thought. No, no. Yeah, he said he was going to another one. I thought he was going to go to oh. two seventy nine, but he said sir four. Okay. Right. And then um, in the fourth chapter, um, verse forty six, it says among among those who are Jews and those who dis distort the meaning of the word and and say we hear and and disobey and disobey, and hear as one who hears not. And attend to us, twisting their tongues and disparaging religion. Mm -hmm. And had they say we are here and obey and listen and regard us, it would it would have been better for them and more proper. 
but God cares them for their disbelief, so they believe not, save a few. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. now, real now, quickly, can I address four? Chapter yeah, yeah, four, yeah, just, I, just, I just wanted to say something uh, very quickly. Um, Muhammad, uh, we, yes. thank, we thank you for actually bringing these directly to us, because something that a lot, of, a lot of other Muslims do, they'll make a video saying, this verse refutes you and answers your question, and then the mm -hmm. people who watch the video never actually bother to look it up or or to go and um, and see how we respond to these things. Whereas you're bringing it up right here during a live stream, and this is this is something that I find interesting. Notice the the Muslims who say, aha, I've answered David Wood and Sam Shamoon. When we say, well, join us live and show that you've answered us, they're nowhere to be found. Whereas you're actually on here saying, no, I believe this refutes you, and here are my arguments. So once again, uh, we, have, we have far more respect for that. But uh, yeah. yeah, so so just so, just to remind everyone, the challenge that I put forward, and the reason I put this this challenge forward was, the Quran never does anything apart from affirming, the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the gospel, mm -hmm. right? Whereas your average Muslim goes around telling people that, the according to the Quran, the gospel has been corrupted, when you don't find one word of that, and so Sam. Um, yes. Our friend, our friend Muhammad here has yep. given us two Recorded, verses. Yeah. I can actually pull either one of them up on the screen. I'm on, uh, I'm yeah. on the Quran browser. So, yeah. yeah. Well, here's the thing. I want to start with four, and I, I, I suggest the young man listen to our responses because we dealt with both. But you stopped. You read chapter four, verses 44, 46, but you didn't read verse 47. So, David, you want to put up chapter four, verse 47, and I'll deal with chapter three, verse 78. And then I'm going to ask you a question to show you why these passages do not meet the challenge. Because to say they twisted it with their tongue, meaning that they're misinterpreting the text. We're talking about corrupting the text, changing the text, not misinterpreting it. But when you have it up, let me know. Chapter 4, verse 47. Just the very verse after that. The very verse after that. Did you yeah, put it up? Yeah, I, I have those up. And I have, uh, what translations do I have up here? I have Pikthal, Yusuf Ali, Hilal yeah, Khan, and read, M.H. I'll Shakir. read from Pikthal. I'll start with Pikthal. I'll just read the Pikthal. Are you ready now, Muhammad? So, I'm going to read it for you. And I'm ready. Okay. So wait, just oh, let, wait, wait one second. Let me just show everyone where we're at. Before I have the to... rapture, buddy. So rapture. what do you want, Pikthal? Yeah, yeah, just put the Pikthal. Before the rapture. I don't want to leave you behind. 447. Why are you always complaining about something? All right, so ladies and gentlemen, that's the one in the bottom, in the bottom left-hand corner. Go ahead. Okay. Here's Pikthal. Now, Muhammad, pay attention. This is the verse right after what you quoted. O you unto whom the scripture hath been given, believe in what we have revealed, confirming that which you possess, musaddiqan, confirming from the verb sadaqa, before we destroy countenances so as to confound them or curse them as we curse the Sabbath breakers of old time, the command of Allah is always executed. Here it says that the Quran confirms what they have. So if I were to read this in context, the passage is not saying Jews are Christians, specifically the Jews, corrupted the text, meaning they changed the text. They corrupted its meaning by misinterpreting it. That's why it says they changed the words with their tongues. And David Wood's challenge is not show me a verse where the Quran says Jews and Christians misinterpret the text with their tongues, but where the books, their texts have been changed. So that doesn't help because here it says that the Quran confirms what they have. Here it is. Believe in what we have revealed, confirming what you possess. And don't take my word for it, Muhammad. The word sadaqa always in the Quran means to bear witness to the truth of something, testifying that that thing is true. What about chapter 3, verse 78? Let's go there. Chapter 3, verse 78. Now again, if you want, we'll just read Pikthal, and I'm going to read Ibn Kathir's commentary. Chapter 3, verse 78. So let's get there. When you get there, chapter 3, verse got, 78. Got it up. Give, all right. Top, now I'm going to read Pictal again. Top left-hand corner, everyone. Yeah. Okay, now watch again carefully, Muhammad. Pay attention carefully. And lo, there is a party. So not even every one of them. A party of them who distort the scripture with their tongues. It doesn't say they change the text. They change the book. They distort what's in the book with their tongues that you may think what they say is from the scripture. So they'll tell you, hey, the Bible says this, and you're going to think the Bible says it, but it doesn't say it. When it is not from the scripture, and they say it is from Allah, when it is not from Allah, and they speak a lie concerning Allah knowingly. Now, Muhammad, even though Ibn Kathir believed the Bible was corrupted, he believed it. He believed they changed the text. There were 
were variant readings. Even though he believed that, notice what he says. I want to now quote Ibn Kathir, his commentary on 378. Are you ready for it? Yeah. Okay, here's what he says. So hear me carefully. Ibn Kathir did think the Bible was changed, the text. But even though he believed that, notice who he quotes, and I need you to hear it carefully. Mujahid al-Shabbi al-Hassan Katada or Katada al-Rabbi bin Anas said that who distort the book with their tongues means they alter words. Al-Bukhari reported that Ibn Abbas said that the ayah means they alter and add, although none among Allah's creation can remove the words of Allah from his books, they alter and distort their apparent meanings. Let me repeat what Bukhari said. Bukhari is quoting Ibn Abbas again one more time. Although none among Allah's creation can remove the words of Allah from his books, you can't do that. Those books are preserved. So how do they change it? They alter and distort their apparent meanings. They misinterpret it. Now, Wahab bin Munabbah, Wahab bin Munabbah said, The Torah and Injil remain as Allah has revealed them, and no letter in them was removed. However, the people must guide others by addition and false interpretation. So they rely on books, like the Talmud, I'm saying that, relying on books that they wrote themselves. And they say, this is from Allah, but it's not from Allah. Now watch again. As for Allah's books, they are still preserved and cannot be changed. Ibn Abi Hatim recorded the statement. So no, Muhammad, neither passage that you quoted says, the books have been changed. They remove verses from the books. No, it says they misinterpret with their tongues. But Muhammad, don't you Muslims to this day do that with the Quran? In other words, don't the Shia change the meaning of the Quran with their tongue? Don't the <clears throat> nation of Islam change the meaning of the Quran with their tongue? Don't they do that? Shias. Yes. Is... So they do that, right? No. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. The, no, no. Ma it, right? Muhammad, the question is, are there Muslims who distort the meaning of the Quran with their tongues in, in their speech? Are there Muslims who distort the meaning of the Quran? Well, you say that about um, every religion. Every That's religion, true. That, you are, you are, no, you are, you are exactly we right. We, yeah, we, we agree completely. So here's our position on the Quran. What the Quran actually does, Muhammad really believed that Jews had the original preserved word of God, and he believed that Christians still had the authentic, authoritative word of God. Because his theology didn't allow that that human beings would overpower God and corrupt his words. We look at that and say, that's actually pretty good theology right there insofar as that is concerned. But he but he looked around and said, wait a minute, Jews, Jews and Christians have dis disagreements and differences. Therefore, they must be distorting their scriptures, not by changing the text, not by changing the text, but by distorting the meanings with their mouths. So keep in mind, this is an oral culture. And people who could read would read the scripture to others. And so the position of Muhammad is that the, the, the leaders and preachers and so on are misleading the population about what the authoritative texts say. So again, just look at the two passages you quoted. And again, these, these are standard passages. If you look at the Muslims who responded to that video and said, ha ha, David, we got you. This is where the Quran affirms the corruption of the text. Just look one more time. And lo, there is a party of them who distort the scripture with their tongues. You already acknowledged that you could say that about Muslims. You could say that about any religion. You could always say that there are people who corrupt the scripture with their tongues. But that's the only criticism in Surah 378 is that there, there are people who distort the Bible with their tongues. Well, that doesn't tell you anything about whether the Bible itself has been corrupted. They're corrupting it with their tongues, not by not by changing the scripture. And then in 446, some of those who are Jews change the word from their context and say, we hear and disobey, hear thou as one who heareth not and listen to us. And so on. distorting with their tongues and slandering religion, distorting with their tongues. So doing the exact same thing in 78. And as Sam pointed out, if you just look, at the very next verse, O you, O ye unto whom the scripture has been given, believe in what we have revealed, confirming that which you possess. So he, he's, he, uh, the, the Quran can't be more clear here. Guys, I'm condemning what you're saying with your mouth because you're twisting the scriptures, but I'm confirming the scriptures that you have in your hands. And so, uh, you know, it's just, we, we see video after video of Muslims saying, you see, these are the verses that prove the Bible's been corrupted. When if you read the text, it says the exact opposite. 
The, the Quran does nothing but affirm the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the Jewish and Christian scriptures. And the problem that presents is that there are only two possibilities. Either we have the word of God or we don't have the word of God. If we have the word of God, then Islam is false because Islam contradicts what we have. If we don't have the word of God, then Islam is false because Islam confirms the scriptures that we actually have. So if Christians have the word of God, Islam is false. If Christians don't have the word of God, Islam is false. Either way, Islam is false. And that's just a problem with your prophet claiming that he is supported in scriptures that he claimed were authoritative, still authoritative, and believe that they line up with him when they clearly don't. And so this is why, this is why, Muslim apologists like Adnan Rashid and so many others have to claim that the Quran affirms the corruption of the gospel. They have to say that because otherwise Islam just has to be false. So the only way to avoid this dilemma, basically, again, if the Quran affirms our scriptures, Islam is false. It has to be because it's affirming scriptures that contradict Islam. So if the Quran affirms our scriptures, Islam is false. Muslim apologists don't want to admit that Islam is false, and so they have to find it in there somewhere. And the only way they can do that is to distort what the Quran actually says. But here, here's the general rule. If the only way you can defend a book is by distorting it and corrupting it and changing it, notice, here's, here's, what's, here's what I find most hilarious about this. Notice what this verse is condemning. These yep. verses are condemning people's saying. twisting scriptures with their tongues. Well, what's Adnan Rashid doing? What's Shabir Ali That's doing? Fine. What are these Muslims doing? They're twisting the Quran with their tongues. They stand condemned. Now, you're pointing out you're not you're not an apologist, you're not a scholar, so we don't believe that you're trying we don't believe that you're trying to to deceive. We believe you actually, you know, you got you looked at these verses and you say, "Hey, it does sound like this is talking about corruption." So, we we don't have any we don't have any problem with you. We actually appreciate this. If you think a verse refer, refutes our position, by all means, bring it to us and, and challenge us on it and we'll go ahead and see if see if we yeah. can respond. But Muslims who've been through this issue, Muslims who've read these passages, I don't see how I don't see how they could possibly not be not be deceptive. You have once Ma you once you've read these passages and you you've you've seen the criticisms. If you still maintain, nope, that talks about the corruption of the scripture when it specifically says when it specifically says that Allah is confirming what we have, and then right before that, He condemns people twisting the scriptures with their tongues, and then these 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 people will go on and twist this twist their own book with their tongues. I don't see how they I don't see how they can be taken seriously. Muhammad, understand what he just told you. I know because he, he, he was emphasizing it so people get it. But I want you to get it real simply. By taking these passages and misinterpreting them, Muhammad, he's saying the Muslims are gu guilty of doing that. You just twisted the Quran with your tongue. See, that's his point. I want you to not forget what he's saying. The reason why he's taking time to say it so the Christians get it. But Muhammad, when you take a verse and you misinterpret it, you're now guilty. You now twisted it with your tongue. The very thing that Jews and Christians are being condemned for. So do you want to keep doing that or you want to stop doing that? I'll stop doing that now that like, I've seen why. Because like, you've presented a good reason saying that there's like, no, these verses don't say that. I like and, you, and, man. No, no, well, no. I, mean, and, I really like you, dude. And, and Sam, really like Sam, you. we're not, we're, we're, we're dead serious here. So one, he had the courage to, he had the courage to come on. And two, he was respectful the entire time, didn't try screaming over anyone and so on. And then three, was willing to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to bring these verses forward to actually challenge you guys with it. And then four acknowledged, okay, now that I understand your points, I'll stop using that. So Amazing. nothing, yeah, nothing. You're great. Nothing but we, we respect for you. For you we pray for you. Come back if you have questions. We'll be more than happy to talk about Jesus next time around. God guide you, my friend. You are amazing. Goodbye. All right. Take catch care, you later. And we'll catch everyone else later. I don't think we have any specific plan for tomorrow. We've gone one week. Uh, we had, I think we had Muslims on with us five days, and I think uh, yeah. two of the days the schedule didn't work out. Uh, there was a Muslim who was willing to be on tomorrow, but he couldn't do eight. He wanted to do like noon or something like that because he's in a different time zone. Um, we'll probably hold off of live streaming for a couple days. We've, uh, I mean, Sam won't. If you check Sam's, uh, go to Sam's channel if you want live stream. Yeah. Sam goes live uh, sometimes multiple yeah, times. It'll be related to Christian. If I do a topic tomorrow, God willing, he's going to be responding to a Jehovah Witness. So I got to see my schedule. But yeah, um, you let me know. Whatever you want to do, I'm available. So yeah, so we'll we have we have no specific plans. But any of you Muslims who are watching, if you want to go live this weekend, feel free to contact me. Um, you can go to my 
my YouTube channel and go to the about page and you can find my email address there. Email me and say, hey, you know, here's the time when I'm free. It, it, it helps if you're free at eight o'clock p.m. because that's when we normally go live and people don't always get notifications. So it helps to be consistent in the time we go live. But uh, if you want to go live, then, then we'll set it up. Uh, apart from this, people have been people have been telling us we should do this. Hey, may, maybe a Maybe the last week of every month we'll call Muhammad week, but we do want to cover yeah. some other topics. We do want to cover, uh, you know, the Quran, uh, the Bible, the Trinity, the deity of Christ. Uh, we want to cover all these topics, but maybe, maybe we'll we'll dedicate some time pretty regularly to going live to discuss Muhammad and really to give to give Muslims like uh, Muhammad here the opportunity to come on and, and share their arguments. And if they have any questions then we're, we're happy to interact with them. All right, Sam, any, any uh, final thoughts there? Guys, just keep praying. If you guys believe God has called us to ministry, Dave, myself, and the others, pray God will protect us from spiritual attacks, from Satan, from harm, protect our family, you know, preserve them with health and provision, and ask the Lord Jesus to make us holy for his glory, not just lip service, because the battles are real, the struggles are real, Satan is real, but we are victorious over the devil by the blood of Jesus, that covers us. We plead the blood of Christ as our shield. Christ is risen, risen indeed. So pray for us, pray for our children, especially my daughters, and that the Lord will save us for his glory. That's about it. Amen. And guys, I, I just have to point out, we invited 1.6 billion Muslims to join us live. <laughs> and we said, we give you an opportunity to talk to all of our viewers and to defend Muhammad. We gave them, if they wanted 10 minutes, we gave them 10 minutes. If they wanted 15 minutes, we gave them 15 minutes. If they wanted a little longer, we gave them a little longer. But we gave them the opportunity to build a case for their profit. Guys, um, you've seen a week. You've seen a week worth of arguments for Muhammad. What do you think? Are you convinced <laughs> that Muhammad is a true prophet and that he brought the true religion? Um, you Muslims who are watching, you Muslims who are watching, what do you think? Have you seen anything? Have you seen anything that confirms your belief? Let me know in the chat or in the comments section. All right. All right. Take, Take care. care. Later. Price is risen. Bye-bye. New video in the morning. All right. Yasir Qadi again. Beautiful.